Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! listening to James O'Brien and it's been a while since we dived into the Brexit pool but we have little choice today but doing it's the sound of me limbering up on the diving board before we once again immerse ourselves in a pool of well I'm beginning to think it's not actually political and maybe that's the way we'll go into it today it's not political it's actually psychological now Brexit there is if you will pretty much now incontrovertible evidence that most people are waking up to reality and yet that rump remains that idea remains that somehow everything's going to be great just hang in there and we'll bounce back in style governor of the bank of england today explains that he can't put up interest rates which of course hits people with savings which of course continue to diminish and he has said this morning we're poorer as a direct result and we haven't even left yet that's just the beginning Alongside Mr Hammond today, the Governor of the Bank of England. He said that Brexit was likely to make people poorer and that there would need to be a transition period after the completion of the Brexit process in 2019. Now, monetary policy cannot prevent weaker real income growth that's likely to accompany the transition to new trading arrangements with the EU. It can support households and businesses as they adjust to such profound change. The two great economic officers of state. Here's the Bank of England and about two miles down the road, that way, the Treasury. And the leaders of those two institutions, I think, came together today to make one big point about Brexit. Put the economic wealth of Britain first, they both said, even if that means some sacrifices on those controversial issues of sovereignty and strict controls on immigration. Another port, another city. Belfast. Mr Hammond and Mr Carney spoke about struggling consumers weary of austerity and shoppers today admitted that they were feeling the pinch. Well I think things maybe are going up in price a wee bit uh, and obviously if uh, uh, wages aren't going up then people will be feeling the pinch that bit more. At the moment I haven't really seen much of a difference. There's a lot more offers and things in the supermarkets. I think they have gone up. They don't really matter wages like to be honest with you. Higher prices, Brexit, the need for a good deal. There were plenty of warnings today. It was a day for stepping back and taking the wider view on the economy. An economy for consumers so uncertain, Mr Carney said there would be no interest rate rises in the near future. Sunny today, yes, but there could be more squally weather ahead. Kamal Ahmed. BBC News. David Davis, who said uh, just over a year ago, David Davis, our Brexit secretary and lead negotiator, stated categorically that after Brexit, the first stop would be Berlin to do a deal, not Brussels. Of course, that demonstrated, and this, this is the point. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and keep it cool today. I, I've, I've managed to cultivate this sort of reputation for pulling apart people who ring in to explain why they think Brexit is a good idea. And, and that, that's because I'm being political, but they're being psychological. It's a bit like, it's a bit like turning up for a rugby match with a cricket bat. Do you, do you see what I mean? Of course, you, you, your arguments will fall apart like a cheap suit because they're not built on facts. They're not built on evidence. They're built on feelings. I'm going to try to respect that today. I don't know how long it will last. But here's, here's something that really should have... Two things that should have shot the Brexit fox before it had even got out of the forest. First, David Davis, our, our, our lead negotiator, said in May of last year that the first stop would not be Brussels but Berlin because they would be doing a... Um, deal with the Germans. They'll be doing a deal with Germany first. So that means that he had conducted the entire campaign ignorant of the fact that you cannot do a trade deal as, a, as an individual European Union country. The idea that we'd be able to do a deal with Germany and not with the whole of the European Union is bonkers. I mean, it, it is actually bonkers. But David Davis, a senior member of the Leave campaign and now our lead negotiator, believed it was true up to and including the point at which he became Secretary of State for Brexit. That, that, in a rational universe, that should be game over, right? What? The guy in charge of our negotiations didn't even know the most simple fact about European Union 
constitution. He did, but he's in charge of it. It's all right for a bloke down the pub, a fella on the Clapham omnibus, a, a woman in the dog and dark. They might not have realised. Donald Trump didn't realise that he couldn't do a trade deal with Germany alone. Angela Merkel had to explain it to him 13 times. And on the 13th occasion, the penny dropped. And his response was, OK, we'll do a, we'll do a deal with the whole of the European Union then. Th these are matters of historical record. They're matters of fact. But they're not cutting through with some people. I read Quentin Letts in the Daily Mail today saying, ah, oh, we don't care, we're really happy, we've been waiting for years to leave. Ha ha ha, da da da. So it doesn't cut through with people like Quentin. It just doesn't cut through. These are facts, right? Just like Donald Trump, David Davis didn't know the rules. And he's now negotiating the new ones. It's absolutely terrifying. Point number two that should have shut the whole thing down in the first place is the freedom of movement legislation. Um, a absolutely clear, anybody, and we've had it on the program. I, I must put my hands up and say, even I didn't know uh, the full extent of the regulations and the freedoms that we had with regard to freedom of movement. As a member of the European Union, if somebody comes to this country and fails to find a job after three months, we are entitled to ask them to leave. As a member of the European Union, if someone from another member state comes to this country and uh, we can insist that they pay health insurance and we can insist that they demonstrate assets, we can, we can put a figure on the amount of money they have to be able to prove that they possess before they're allowed to stay in this country after that three-month window. We are allowed to do that. How do I know this? Because British people in Germany have to jump through these hoops. They measure the people coming in and they measure the people coming out. They track them. The British government was free to do that. Free to do that from Maastricht onwards, I think. You, you might have to correct me on some of the finer detail. From, 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 I mean, for years, the British government has been free to... Tony Blair's government was free to do that. Gordon Brown's government was free to do that. David Cameron's government was free to do that. Theresa May's government, I, I mean, is still free to do this, theoretically. Even though there wouldn't be much point. So, we could do it. I didn't realise the full extent of these rules within the European Union, but I wasn't running the Remain campaign. What, why did nobody in the Remain campaign stand up and say, we've got control of our borders, we just choose not to exercise it, because anybody with an abacus can see that it would cost a hell of a lot more money than it's ever going to save? I don't know the answer to that question. You could tell me, 0345 973 is the number that you need. Why, why do you think that that wasn't made in the Remain campaign? Because here's the thing, if David Davis, Brexit secretary, row of the summer, over by lunch, David Davis didn't know that he wasn't allowed to deal and negotiate exclusively with Germany, and he's ended up Brexit secretary. It's not beyond the wit of man, is it, to conclude that people on the Remain side simply didn't know that we had everything we needed in place to provide the so-called controlled immigration that some people genuinely and sincerely think that we need, and some racists pretend they think that we need in order to camouflage their true beliefs. So we could control immigration. We still can, okay? Our lead negotiator doesn't actually know the most simple of rules. The governor of the Bank of England has stated that Brexit has already made us poorer and will continue to do so. A man absolutely vilely impugned by some of the Leave campaigners, by some of the prominent Leave figures. But you'll remember the morning after the um, uh, referendum result came in. It was Mark Carney who stood up and steadied the ship as people like Michael Gove and Boris Johnson with, a, with, a, with an expression of utter shell shock on their face scurried over the horizon. It was Mark Carney that stood up as David Cameron and George Osborne ran away from the conflagration they'd created. It was Mark Carney who stood up and provided guidance, leadership, strength and, dare I say, Stability. You don't have to take my words for that. Just look at what the markets did after he intervened. He, he has been right about almost everything. He was one of the only central bankers in the world to properly steer the 2008 financial crisis when he was in Canada. These are matters of fact. They're historical records. But it doesn't matter because we are not talking about a political phenomenon. It's taken me a year to realise we're talking about a psychological one. This is not politics. This is psychology. If this was politics, if this was about the, the weighing up of evidence and the reaching of conclusions, we never would have had a referendum in the first place. It's psychological. It's a feeling. That's why they use words like... Uh, hordes and breaking point and swarm. That's why they do it. It's psychological. It's not political. It's not factual. It's not intellectual. It's entirely emotional. And the people that are f most furious about this description are the people that are recognising themselves now. 
people are going, he's right. Uh, I mean, everything he said is true. Everything he said is true. Um, but I still want to leave because I'm... I don't know. Because I'm what? Why am I? Like, ah, put the mirror down, James. Put the mirror down. I hate, I hate what I'm seeing in it. I thought, I thought I had arguments. I thought I had evidence. I thought I had reasons. I thought I had rational rejections in place. But everything you've said is true. Everything you've said is true. We have the power to control our borders. Germany does. The economic impact is already being felt. The governor of the Bank of England told us. The chancellor of the Exchequer, who, of course, was also a Remain campaigner, just like Theresa May was, just like every single chancellor of the Exchequer you have ever known wanted to remain in the European Union, except Nigel Lawson, who lives in France, and told a newspaper, or, or was reported in a newspaper last week, as explaining why Theresa May called a snap election, as because the economy is going to tank in the short term, but ideally with five years, five years on the clock, then they might have time for it to start recovering before they go to the polls again. So Nigel Lawson effectively explaining that if you're poor, suck it up. He'll be fine in his, in his southern French villa, but if you're poor, you're just going to have to suck it up for a couple of years while we cross our fingers and hope that things improve. And now, the clincher. Nobody wants to lead the Tory party. Nobody wants that job. Nobody wants to be prime minister, and you have to ask yourself why. Philip Hammond, I think, and we'll talk to Theo about this later, Philip Hammond, I think, has... Um, just pitched his tent this morning for the prospect of being the the no Brexit Prime Minister. He would like to be Prime Minister if Brexit wasn't happening. But if we accept Brexit as a given, okay, nobody wants the job. So you have to ask yourself this. Look at the pathetic uh, machinations undertaken behind the scenes while they were trying to elect the last leader. Uh, Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson with his letters, Michael Gove with his stiletto in the back of his old mate Boris. That that woman, what's her name? The jam woman? Andrea Leadsom, coming out of nowhere, having previously insisted several, several times that leaving the European Union would be an economic disaster. She then turned somehow into a person who believes and who said that it wouldn't have any economic impact whatsoever. She was in the frame for the big job. They all wanted it. They all fancied it because they'd all bought into the psychological project that it was going to be great. You remember? The sunny uplands, the have your cake and eat it. The annual lavish mansion house banquet was cancelled last week after the Grenfell Tower fire. Today, the same location hosted a less lavish gathering. To hear this barbed reference to Boris Johnson's we can have our cake and eat it view of Brexit from the Governor of the Bank of England. Depending on whether and when any transition arrangement can be agreed, firms on either side of the channel may soon need to activate contingency plans. And before long, we will all begin to find out the extent to which Brexit is a gentle stroll along a smooth path towards the land of cake and consumption. It was going to be fantastic, and now, None of them want the job. Uh, Theresa May would be toast if anybody wanted that job. It would take about 13 seconds flat to get a vote of no confidence in Theresa May after that election result. Tory MPs who've lost their jobs. Tory MPs who've lost their majorities. Tory MPs who've gone from safe to unsafe seats. She, she'd be out on her ear in a moment if anybody fancied it. But nobody does. And you have to wonder why. Why in the space of a year, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, Andrea Leadsom, David Davis, Liam Fox, all the prominent leavers who've all got enough ambition to have at various times in their career had a tilt at or, or, or a desire for the big job. Why? Why don't they want the job? If leaving the European Union is going to be a magnificent march into the sunny uplands, it's going to be a magnificent march into the land of having your cake and eating it. It's going to be a time of economic uh, resurgence. It's going to be a time of social improvement. It's going to be a time of magic and wonder. If it's so wonderful to get our country back, why don't any of them want to lead it at the moment? And you know the answer. If you're being political, intellectual, factual, the answer is they don't want to have their hand on the tiller when we embark upon this ludicrous journey, a journey that began yesterday with David Davis having described the row of the summer. The row of the summer. That would be the big row of the summer, refusing to let the European Union dictate the terms of the negotiations. That row lasted until lunch. None of them want their hand on the tiller as this voyage 
gets underway. And you have to ask yourself why. If you're factual, political, intellectual, you know the answer. If you're not, if you're still psychological, emotional, well, you're still waiting for your unicorn. It's 10.15. I probably should have asked you a question. Apparently, apparently, that's how this format is supposed to work. So, so here you are. Um, what do you think we're doing, and why do you think we're doing it with regard to Brexit? And and also, I mean, son, maybe it'd be a bit fun for you to have a pot shot at me if you fancy it. This dichotomy between the political and the psychological. Do you recognise it? Because when you list all of the evidence, all of the facts, all of the individual contributions from people who know what they're talking about, you, you're left, I would argue, with with absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the very best we can hope for is a long period of uncertainty at the end of which things hopefully won't be um, too much worse than they currently are. So, so what are we doing and why are we doing it with regard to Brexit? 0345 Just so we're clear, the man leading the negotiations said on, on, in May of last year, he revealed that he was utterly ignorant of the fact that we're not allowed to do trade deals with individual European Union countries and also was ignorant, as Liam Fox was, of the fact that we're not allowed to do any negotiations at all with anybody until we're actually out of the European Union. So we can't even start until March 2019. These are facts. This is what David Davis said in May of this year. So we've got this very big, ambitious free trade agreement. We want to get on with that as soon as possible, not to hang around, because what happens then? This is with the European Union. You can't have a free trade agreement with the European Union unless you buy into the four fundamental freedoms. But, you know, he still doesn't get that. That becomes pressure on us, not to hang around, because what happens then? That becomes pressure on us. The negotiating pressure is on us. That's why it's designed this way, to get over the most difficult bit, the funding of Northern Ireland, before we do anything else. So Davis was insisting on May the 14th that we deal with the, with the payoff, the, the, if you like, the divorce settlement, and Northern Ireland before we do anything else. But now I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by the Brexit Secretary, David. Davis, uh, very good to see you. Mm. Let's just get on to the process. So, mm. talking to EU officials the other day, they say that the next big event in terms of the negotiation will be a meeting either with you or whoever Labour wins their Brexit yeah. secretary. Uh, and if I'm not sacked, all right. <laughs> uh, well, not sacked, but anyway, yeah. on the assumption you're still in the job, yeah. um, they say the next big event will be a meeting between you and Michel Barnier, their main negotiator, mm. at the end of June. Yeah. And that will be a conversation about the mandate they've published for how these talks will go. Mm. So, do you accept the structure that they've put on these talks broadly, that you have to talk about money, migrants and Ireland, before you get on to trade? Not entirely, and that'll be, a, that'll be the first discussion. So, uh, so which bit of that don't you accept? Well, m m money in Ireland. Well, look, let's get on to the hard facts, yeah. Yeah. which is, you know, you are going to have to talk to Michel Barnier about his proposals for how we do the yeah. negotiation, and you've already said that you don't accept mm. that money uh, has to be, he says, the formula for how much we pay them has to be support, uh, has to be decided before we get on to trade talks. And you're saying you're having none of that, is that no, right? Well, what, what, what we've said is Article 50 says, yeah. that, you know, you'll, you'll decide what is now called the divorce arrangement, but yeah. you know, the separation, um, uh, uh, taking into account the ongoing relationship. Well, how can you take into account an ongoing relationship yeah. which doesn't exist yet? So, uh, and, and we take the view, We've got this big, very ambitious free trade agreement we want to undertake. We want to yeah. get on with that as soon as possible. Yeah. Not to hang around while... You know, because th what happens then? That becomes pressure on us. The negotiating pressure is on us. This is why it's designed this way. To get over the, the most difficult bit, the funding and Northern Ireland, uh, before we do anything else. And Northern Ireland, by the way, mm. how on earth do you resolve the border, the issue of the border with yeah. Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, yeah. unless you know what our general borders policy is, what the customs agreement is, what the free trade agreement is, whether you need to charge tariffs at the border or not. You can't decide one without the other. It's wholly illogical, and we happen to think are the wrong interpretation of the treaty. But so that'll but be the row of the summer. <laughs> But the UK has yet to decide, and Article 50 has been triggered, so negotiations have to begin between Mr Davis and his opposite number, Michel Barnier. This day was about setting the tone. Already they decided talks will happen in English and French one week a month. 
They swapped gifts on a mountaineering theme. Many believe in front of them is a mountain to climb. The first item on the talk's agenda will be how to secure citizens' rights in future for EU citizens in the UK, UK citizens in the EU. How to calculate the UK's financial obligations to the EU. And how to avoid new border controls between the UK and Ireland. Well, our Europe editor James Mates is in Brussels. So James, has the UK then caved into the EU over the way these talks are actually going to be conducted? Well, pretty much, yes. One of the reasons they talked about progress today is that London has agreed to do it exactly as the rest of the EU said it was going to happen, right up until the weekend. Uh, London had insisted we want to talk about uh, our eventual trade relationship, a trade deal, alongside the divorce issues of citizens' rights and the Brexit bill. Well, it turns out we're going to do it exactly as Europe wanted to. First, those tricky issues, and only when enough progress has been made on that. In other words, only after we've effectively agreed to the Brexit bill uh, will uh, they talk about our future trade relationship, which does, it seems, illustrate uh, just how weak the UK's negotiating position is going to be uh, in these talks, because the clock is ticking and it's ticking against us, and there's really not going to be very much leverage. Uh, Michel Barnier was asked, could you name one concession that you have made to the British in these talks today? And he simply looked and said, well, it was them who asked to leave. He went further. Northern Ireland, by the way, how on earth how do you resolve the border, the issue of the border with Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, unless you know what our general borders policy is, what the customs agreement is, what the free trade agreement is, whether you need to charge tariffs at the border or not. David Davis stated last month, you can't decide one without the other. It's wholly illogical, and we happen to think the wrong interpretation of the treaty. So that will be the row of the summer. And yesterday, it started, this row, and it was over by lunch. And he's in charge. And you're not scared? Phone me now and tell me why. 0345 6060 973. Chris is in Blackheath. Chris, what are we doing and why are we doing it? James, I am scared. I am quaking in my boots, James. And I tell you the reason why, because when it all goes horribly wrong, people start turning on people. There's no need for Brexit. There's not, there's, there's not an ounce of evidence that there's a need for Brexit. But because people like Nigel Farage, because he goes down the pub, he drinks a beer, everyone thinks he knows what he's talking about. People watch the EastEnders more than they do um, show interest in politics. But they were given a question... And, and I don't, I don't want you to sound like you're patronising them. I know you don't intend to. I'd rather watch EastEnders than politics. I've just got a weird addiction. So uh, perfectly normal not, not to take that deep an interest in matters and to be... I mean, history dictates that people are always easily persuaded by sort of cheery demagogues who, who mask their toxic messages with, 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 with sort of chuckles and yellow teeth. Well, look at it this way then, James. As you said for yourself, okay, you can't um, have a, a, a trade deal with one individual country in Europe. And everyone thought that, oh, you should could, like the politicians. So they, don't, they haven't got a clue what they're talking about. They haven't got a clue what they're doing. And do you know what? In terms of Brexit actually being good or bad for England, we, or, or the UK, we may not know for another 50 to 100 years. By that time, a majority of us will be dead. So all those people that have voted for it will be dead. And they won't benefit from it. This is the problem that we're faced with. We went to war to fight people like Hitler. There's so much blood on, on, the, on the ground of Europe so that people could live together. Things like the European Union and the, the Human Rights Act, they are British creation. It's like it was Churchill who wanted people to live together. It was, it was, it was manufactured. That came so what, what, what do you think? What do you think is happening? I mean, you're right. I, the, the, uh, the, particularly the recent evolutions of the European Union were Margaret Thatcher's invention. But, but the Remain campaign, increasingly, I want to make this absolutely clear. Um, <laughs> the Remain campaign didn't make these points. They didn't make the point that we have plenty of freedom under European Union law to, to have a much, much more robust immigration uh, scenario, much more robust borders. They didn't make any of the points that you've just made. I can't even remember what their key arguments were. Except predictions. They, they predicted that the economy would suffer. They predicted that the pound would tank. They predicted... Oh, hang on, all that's come true. I tell you what happened with, and I'm a Remainer. I will be a Remainer till the day I die. 
whether it's 100 years' time or whether it's today. Well, no, you won't. You won't, because you're rational. And if in 85 years' time, and by some miracle of modern science, you happen to still be alive, and we are demonstrably and clearly better off than the member states of the European Union, you will be rational and evidence-based, and you'll be glad we're not in it. James, I'm a day and four years older than you. Just a day and four years. And let me tell you this, James. God, I've been doing this job too long. How the heck do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> it's our birthday. Yeah. Right, so, well, this is what I know, James. Is the fact is that the Remain campaign was ignorant of its enemy. They, but they, they were too confident that we were going to stay. They should have thrown everything at it. You know, including... Yeah, but they were political. They yeah. were being political, and the other side were being psychological. They turned up to a rugby game with a cricket bat, or they turned up to a knife fight with some battered old boxing gloves and a copy of the Queensbury Rules. Do you know what? I can't argue with you there. Well, you're, you're, well someone's going to have to, otherwise it's going to be a very long morning. Chris, a belated happy birthday to you. It's 10.25, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. That's it, isn't it? It's political versus psychological. So they'll never, they'll never... Or will they? I mean, will you? I don't know. What, what made you realise... The truth. Let's just find that comment today in the mail, because I thought it was really significant. Oh, I'm probably going to have ripped it out. No, here we go. Another, this is Quentin Letts. A journalist I really like, actually. I, I, another inexorable step to freedom, May Brave. That's French for, you know, my comrades, my brave comrades. The Brexit talks with Brussels started properly yesterday. Those are the Brexit talks with Brussels that David Davis said were never going to happen because our first stop would be in Berlin. They started yesterday, and at the end of a day which began with presents and included a slap-up lunch, the two chief negotiators held a reasonably civilised press conference. A sombre moment, Mr Barnier? That's what Michel Barnier said. Not for those who want to go. We're delighted. It is a very sombre moment, said Monsieur Barnier. And Quentin Letts writes, Not for those of us who for decades wanted to leave it isn't, Michel. We're delighted. To which the question becomes, why? And the answer has now become, uh, because we want to get our, what, our laws, our borders and something else back. And all of the evidence shows that we never lost them in the first place. White paper on Brexit. The British Parliament has always been sovereign. Immigration regulations, ask a British person trying to move to Germany what that's like and what they have to do to get there. Laws, ah, oh, come off it. <laughs> you mean like the, uh, the cladding that they banned in Germany but apparently didn't ban here. So, so Germany can make a law to ban that stuff but we can't? EU legislation provides, as I understand it, minimum levels. And then you can use domestic legislation to, to, to go above that minimum level wherever you want. So why would anybody want to leave? Because the minimum levels that we currently have to observe. Well, I don't want to go there, actually. It wouldn't be appropriate while that body count is still rising. But if the, if the levels we've got now are too high, what sort of a monster are you? Uh, where are we going next? Lucy's in Queensway. Lucy, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Um, well, I'm an employment lawyer, and I was... Sorry, a... no, country's had enough of experts, Lucy. <laughs> Didn't you get the memo? <laughs> Well, this is, I'm just flummoxed, flummoxed from Queensway because I'm an employment lawyer and I was working for big corporates when the Maastricht Treaty came in. And oh, yes. I was involved in, um, you know, translating all the policies from what they were to the new policies with much better employment rights. And I was so proud to be an employment lawyer because look, look at the, these minimum requirements. And of course, the UK did adopt the minimum requirements. Yes. But nonetheless, they afforded fantastic employment rights for people. And when this whole Brexit thing came up, and I happened to be living in Norfolk at the time, so over a year ago, I was saying to people, guys, your employment rights are going to go. And they wouldn't hear me. They just wouldn't hear me. So I completely agree with your, your assessment that the psychological... Well, the response is, no, they won't. We'll, we'll put them back in place. And then the same people say, well, we're going to have less regulation. I mean, they're not going to use the word bonfire for a while for reasons that I'm, I don't need to explain to anybody. Yeah. But this great call for a bonfire of regulations. Jacob Rees-Mogg saying there's no reason why we couldn't operate with the same sort of legislation that they have in India. <laughs> Exactly. So and what it, happened? Uh, what, what's happened? Like, how has half the country gone so mad? I don't understand. I am flummoxed. I, I, reason will just not be listened to. And these are people that I like, yes. that I know, they like me, they're rational people, they're not crazy. They're ju they were just obsessed with supremacy. The immigration issue was definitely amongst it. But when it shouldn't have been. Anybody who's tried to move from Britain to Germany can tell you that it's very easy to put up much higher fences in Absolutely. terms of bureaucracy than the ones we currently have in place. Absolutely. And, and the person I have to point the finger at really is Jeremy Corbyn. Where was he? Why were these things not explained? Why were they not? Maybe he tried. Who knows? Well, I, I'm going to 
defend him up to a point, but all I'm going to do is, is, is <laughs> forgive the slightly odd turn of phrase, all I'm going to do is take you by the finger, Lucy, and then redirect it towards Alan Johnson, a politi another politician I really like, yes. but who, he was actually the leader of the Labour Leave campaign. True. Uh, where, where were they? <laughs> Yes. And why weren't they making the arguments that you've been it, making? It is just a huge unfairness that has happened to our country. It's psych uh, is it psychological it's versus political, or is that unfair? It's psychological. It's completely psychological. It's the, it's the only argument I'm that there is. You know, nice, grown-up, intelligent, talented men like Quentin Letts just saying, we're delighted! Why? No yeah. no reason. What, so no. We're just del we're still delighted. Yay! Woo! Yeah. Fish. Yeah. Fish. It's madness. Well, we'll see. So someone is going to be able to, 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 to calm our beating hearts, Lucy. It's half past ten. It's psychological, not political. Get over that hurdle and it all begins to make sense because every single argument put forward during the referendum campaign and subsequently to explain why it was a good result for Britain, um, it falls apart under the barest of scrutiny. But it, it doesn't matter because if you're going with your feelings, uh, we don't care, Monsieur Barnier. We're delighted to be leaving, but you don't have a really explain why then it's 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 two different games that are unfolding on two different pitches we all thought we were on the same pitch and and just to put the icing the cherry on the icing on the cake do you remember ivan rogers do you remember ivan rogers sir ivan rogers he was the uh, permanent representative of the united kingdom to the european union for for about four years well from november 2013 until january 2017 do you know what happened in january 2017 or december 2016 to be more precise he explained to theresa may's government to david davis et al he explained that this insistence on having the negotiations run in parallel so that the divorce settlement and the trade agreement would be discussed simultaneously ivan rogers explained to them that that was not going to happen he explained why and he <laughs> explained when the first day of negotiations ivan rogers told them He's been in the job for four years. He's a career diplomat, a British civil servant who's reached the loftiest ranks of service. He told them this was going to happen. So they sacked him. And then David Davis gets, gets to negotiations yesterday, and the row of the summer lasts until lunch. So what are we doing, and why are we doing it? Tony's in Harrow. Tony, what would you like to say? Hey, good morning, James. Hello, Tony. Um, I have to own up. I voted for Brexit for all the usually mentioned uh, reasons. Um, and if the Remain uh, campaign had told us that we already had all the immigration controls yeah. and the rest of it that we needed that has since come out, I have to say, I don't often agree with you, but mostly through you, then I thought Cameron was scared um, they couldn't do point. it, could they? Because then they'd, they'd no. say, why aren't you doing it? The problem is, and this is where you will disagree with me, yeah. the problem is that, that Blair could have done it, Brown could have done it, Cameron could have done it, but they, do, yeah. they, they crunched the numbers, mate, and they decided that even if we did do it, it would leave us, it would cost us more than it would save. So, yeah. Or, uh, it, I mean, uh, I hear, you, you know, you give a, a stick out to a lot of people, so it's sometimes justified. But, I mean, if the laws existed anyway, yeah. I mean, I felt, I, you know, you say Boris Johnson ran away, um, Farage ran away, I agree with you. But so did Cameron, and why he's getting away with it, yeah. I can't work out. He never once said, if the vote goes against me, I'm leaving. Or if he did, I never heard him. No, he didn't. I, I mean, he, I, I, to be fair, I, I don't think they really thought it was going to happen. I mean, they, they no, probably went no. a little bit psychological as well. But the, 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 the bottom line is that, that I, I mean, I think it's cowardice that they displayed. And, and this notion of George Osborne suddenly becoming the hero because he's publishing negative stories about Theresa May in the Evening Standard. Jog on. I mean, do me a flavor. Yeah. I mean, the bloke's yeah. just as culpable as Cameron. I mean, not only did they think that the vote would go through, I didn't think it would. Although I still cast my vote to leave. I don't think any, everybody was taken completely by surprise. Yes, and and you know. would would you? I mean, I, you you sound actually like an exception to the to the suggestion I've made because you. you were not being emotional then, but now that some facts that should have emerged a lot more loudly and a lot more quickly have emerged, you're yeah. going to you're going to be political or intellectual, and and you'd probably vote differently if you had another chance. I certainly would, knowing what I know now. And, and then we could insist that our domestic politicians explain why they won't do what the German government has done with regard to immigration, yeah. and they'd have to stand up and say, well, it's actually good for the country, and no politician has been prepared to do that since 2005. Uh, but it's why that, you know, why we weren't informed of all the options and all the facts. I mean, the only thing I do have a problem with, with uh, the EU, and you argue against it, I mean, 
something's happened to our fishing industry. I don't know intimately what happened. I do. We've I mean, got we've got thirteen percent of coastal waters that come under United Kingdom ownership, and we've got thirty percent of the European Union fishing quota. But what happened? And, and the, the fish that we do union? catch are, are caught by really, really rich and massive organisations that have hoovered up almost all of our quotas. They're not caught by sort of doughty, uh, horny-handed sons of the soil who are going out on little skiffs and hauling in herring off the Cornish coast, mate. So you think that's what happened to our fishermen? They didn't keep up with the times? It's that? not even a question of keeping up with the times. We, we, we still have a fishing industry, but we're part of the European Union. We can't go tooling off the Spanish coast, hoovering up all the fish that we want. We, we, we look at how much fish there is to be had, and then we... We negotiate our slice of the pie, but you know who was sitting on the relevant committee who could have, over the last 20 years, actually contributed to European Parliament legislation on fishing quotas? You don't need me to tell you, do you, Tony? He never voted once. Is his name Nigel? Could be, mate. Yeah, the other thing I've got against the um, EU is that they've got, they know that they have a law that if a, go if a country votes in a right-wing government, they can bar them from voting in EU votes. That's not true. Is it not true? I mean, I've read it in the Times, so no, I... I mean, unless, unless, we're, well, unless we're misunderstanding each other, I mean, they, 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 they can't. I mean, we, we voted in a right-wing government. No, no, I mean, what they would consider an extremely right-wing uh, government. Uh, well, if you're right, I'd, I'd probably be less troubled. You mean like Mussolini yeah. or Hitler? Yeah, I mean, there was a, apparently... Well, that, was I mean, like, to be fair, if there is a rule like that, where if they elect another Hitler or another Mussolini, we're allowed to say, do you know what, I don't want to be your friend anymore, I could probably roll with that, Tony. Yeah, but <laughs> if it was, um, a, you know, democratically elected party, apparently... Austria like Mussolini and Hitler. Well, no, not them. That well, was, you always you always take it to the extreme, Joe. It's not but, taking you know, it. You said democratically elected. I know, yeah, I know. Well, I think they forced their way in, didn't they? I don't think they were... Well, um, democratically. Well, apparently, Mussolini, I was told in Italy, the trains always ran on time, so we did have a good part to it. <laughs> right, I, I'm going to tell you now. Pretend this I is... You, stay I, there. I want, no. you to give I want you to give Cameron some stick, James. Doesn't He's so off, easy. spending more time with his inheritance. Yeah. There, there's nothing. There's nothing to stick him for, is there? He's helping he's his wife launch a, a fashion label while taking photographs of his feet in posh hotels. He's sitting in a caravan in his back garden writing <laughs> a book. That's what he's doing. <laughs> Here's the thing, right? Pretend this is yeah. breaking news and give me your immediate reaction. Go on. We're having a second referendum. Good news. Oh boy, Tony, you mind how you go? It's ten forty. Shane is in Southall. Shane, what would you like to say? Oh, yeah, um, I'm one of the people who voted out. Um, my main reason for doing that is because of the way the European Union was created. Um, this all started off with the EEC, which was a free trade agreement. Um, and of course, as time has gone on, it's, they've changed you know, rules, brought in new laws, etc. And ones? before we knew it, we were in a, a super state. What's the opposite of super? Well, obviously not much. You know, not many people in it, but of course... Um, no, what's, what's the, the opposite of super? It. Sorry? What's the opposite of super? I'd go with rubbish. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean... I and what, just, uh, just, I don't, let's, let's not fall out, Shane, but I do, I do want you to put some flesh on the bones of what you've just said. So let's start with the laws you don't like. What, what, are, the, what are the laws you don't like? Well, it's the thing, what I'm saying is it's actually... It's, it's came from a free trade agreement, which is the EEC. Which is basically yeah, that, the, that's uh, the just, Trojan horse. With respect, mate, that's just a mantra because inside the Trojan horse, there's lots of soldiers, and now you're going to show me the soldiers. So, what are the laws that you, you've been forced to obey that you don't like? Well, no, what I'm talking about, I'm not, not, I'm not necessarily naming laws, I'm talking about the changes. But you just that said that. Along you just, as, okay, you know, well, tell, tell me about the changes then. Which changes? Well, there's all the, you know, you're talking about going from, what, the 1970s right the way through. Well, that's a calendar. What are the changes <laughs> that you don't like? Well, it's basically the. Um, you know, where you had people, I can't remember the name, the, the uh, politician now, but, so, you know, you had things like the Maastricht Treaty. And what did that change? Well, it was basically, um, it was, I was given our power away. But what power? Sure. Well, sovereignty. Well, British Parliament has always been sovereign. It said that in the Brexit white paper. Yeah, but the thing is, we've given more power well, what power? to Europe. What power? Oh, it's the, well, they basically... The power to do what? And, you know, they, they, they decide what we're going to do. Can you, name, can you name a law or a power or a change? Um, to tell you the truth, I can't. Not, not at this no. moment in time. Could you name any when you voted? Can I? Sorry? Could you name any when you voted? Any? Powers, changes or laws? What, that I voted for? Yeah. I didn't vote for any of them at all. But you said that you voted because we'd lost powers, there'd been changes and, oh, and you didn't, the, and you, and you didn't like the laws. With Brexit. Yeah, so could you name any of the laws, powers and changes that influenced your vote when you cast your vote? Uh, no, I can't put my hand on them at the moment. Could you no. then, do you think? And you've just forgotten them? 
Uh, well, yeah, but all I know is, is that our, you know, our powers have been given away to Europe. But you can't tell me what the powers are? <sighs> no, not offhand, no. Or ever? Maybe not. Second referendum, Shane? Never. No. Why not, mate? <sighs> no, because, well, the way I see the European super state is a, it's, a, it's a control system to control all the countries within. Would it, would, it be better, would it be better if every member had the power to veto any single item of legislation? Would that make you happier? I think it would be better if each yeah. individual country could actually... Veto absolutely everything. If, you, if, if every individual member could veto every single bill in the European Parliament, if every member country had the power to veto anything significant, anything big, would that make you happier? Well, that, that would probably be something, yeah. Because yeah, we do, we have that power. All right, okay, but that still doesn't change the facts. <laughs> No, 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 it does change the facts, Shane. It, ca it absolutely categorically changes the facts because it was something you didn't know and now you do know. So it has changed the facts. Do you know what it hasn't changed? Go on. Your feelings. No, I just, well, I mean, the thing is, if it was done properly, instead of, you know, making little changes all the way along... What that, was what realizing can what can was you name some on. little changes? Sorry? Can you name some little changes? Uh, no, not a fan, no. Okay. But, you know, you're talking about a whole... Uh, a period of years going back from the 70s. Full of, full of changes and powers and laws, not a yeah. single one of which can you name. Well, no, I can't. Okay, but we all know the situation we're in now. It all came from a free trade agreement, now we're in a European super state. How did we get there? But you just keep saying that, Shane, and it doesn't mean anything. You don't even know what super state means. You didn't know that we had a power of veto, and you can't name a single law change or power that you're unhappy or happy about. But, I'm hey, not but hey, it's not about feelings, though, is it, Shane? It's all about <laughs> facts. Well, the fact is... We've gone from a you know, free trade agreement to European super state. That wasn't told to the people at the beginning. But you don't know what those words mean, Shane. Yeah, I do, actually. OK, so what's a European super right. state? So we go from the free trade agreement, which is the EEC. Which involves the four pillars of freedom, freedom of movement being yeah. one of them. OK. That's what we were told in the beginning. There was no... Yeah, so what, what does European super state mean, Shane? Well, basically, it's a fascist super state controlled from Brussels. Yeah. Um, you know, because the simple fact is, if you want to control all the countries of Europe... Mate, when you say the simple facts, I, I mean, simple fits, facts just doesn't. It's a fascist superstate controlled from Brussels that's introduced a whole raft of laws, changes and powers, not a single one of which can you name. OK, well, so I can't name the laws. Maybe you can. But the thing is, I don't like the fact that we've gone from one thing to another. <laughs> yeah, but you don't, know what those being things, you don't know what those things are. And you could easily be informed. You've chosen not to be. I've just been informing you of loads of stuff. I've just given you loads of new facts. And after every single one of them, you've just repeated to me, we've gone from a free trade agreement to a European super state. I'll tell you what, though, Shane. Go on. We've gone from a free trade agreement to a European super state. The negotiations are underway. The refusal by our chief negotiator, David Davis, to allow the European Union to dictate the terms of those negotiations was going to be the row of the summer. That's what he said last month. It was over by lunch. We're doing exactly what they told us we would do. And we're doing exactly what Ivan Rogers, former representative, British representative of the European Union, told them would happen. But when he told them that, they sacked him because, hey, crushed the saboteurs. So what are we doing and why are we doing it? Oh, three, four, five, six, oh, six, oh, nine, seven, three. And I, 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 I think we can probably, it would be fair to, to use Shane as an example of the difference between political and psychological. Political is, is why, what, wherefore. And psychological is because I say so. I just do. It's what I feel. Nadia's in Croydon. Nadia, what would you like to say? I think you've really touched on a nerve there, James. Um, I'm glad you picked this up as a psychological conversation and debate this morning when I turned on your programme, so thanks for that. Um, it, it's, for me, as somebody who voted very firmly to remain in the European Union, this is a lot to do with about Britain's place in the world. And our perception, perhaps generationally, about what that place in the world is. So, um, yes, it could be not generational, but I think there is something definitely to do with that. I did my undergraduate degree in history on Britain's place in the world post the Suez crisis. So I had the fortune of spending a lot of time looking at government papers, discussing things like um, France's veto of us joining the European Union and what that meant for us. And it was really, really interesting to see lots of civil servants, even at that time, talking about this great British empire, how they were absolutely disgusted that the French had vetoed um, the British joining. 
And it was really, really interesting. And since the vote, I think a lot of those debates are resurfacing again, which are very, very unhelpful and unhealthy. And they're even more... Uh, I mean, even more so than in the 1960s. The, 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 yeah. the, the Britain's role on the world stage has changed since the 1960s. It has diminished, yeah. inarguably, but it was still pretty strong. Uh, withdrawal from the European Union takes us out of the largest trading bloc in the world, so it diminishes it still further. That's factual, right? That's political. Psychological, <laughs> psychological is the, the Michael Caine line about I'd rather be a, a poor master than a rich servant. Isn't it? Exactly. That's this idea that we're in hock to a European super state. Grr, I don't know what it is or what it means, but it sounds awful and I don't want to be in it. You know, it's quite interesting. It's, it's, a, it's this kind of very strong nationalist type of politics which seems to permeate. Now, I, I come from a British Pakistani family yes. and um, the cricket was on on Sunday and it didn't take much time for my family who would class themselves as being quite liberal, if you can use that term, <laughs> and quite um, open about these things to suddenly make it out like, you know, we had defeated India at war, probably. <laughs> Stars. <laughs> well, actually, Orwell, I think it was Orwell. It, was it Orwell? I think it was Orwell. It didn't like national sport for that no, reason. It didn't, it, didn't, it didn't. What I'm saying is that... You thought they were like little proxy wars that brought out the worst yeah, in us. Yeah, it doesn't really take much to tap into that toxicity, really. It really, really doesn't. No, and it's not a toxicity in times of, for example, war. You kind of want a slightly yeah. sheep-like army marching on, on the orders yeah. of, a, of an upper class or a general, because otherwise the other lot will win. So, you know, if we exactly. didn't have the First World War, then the, 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 yeah. the, the, the cousin of our king, the Kaiser, he might have won. Exactly, exactly. So I think these things have their time and place, but what the media has done, and the fact, the thing that's really distressing, and, and to me this isn't about whether you voted Remain or whether you voted Leave, is that, you know, the fact that so many lies were told, yeah. that just doesn't seem to be been picked up on. You well, know, it is being picked up people. on, but but but, but it, it, it has been picked up on. But what happens is, I, I had this yesterday, oddly. Um, the, the 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 person who told you you were being lied to gets proved right, and you get cross with him. You don't get cross with the person who told you the lie. Yeah, yeah. And that's weird. That's that. But, but that's my cross to bear, Nadia. You're, you 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 you'll be all right. <laughs> so I'm going to crack on. I look forward to your next call. Thank you. Um, 10.55 is the time. Good grief, an hour down already. I have to tell you, this is quite liberating, isn't it, to get back into, if you will, I mean, disastrous though the view is from here, wherever you are, unless, of course, you've, you've got magic glasses on. Um, this un almost unleavened diet of horror and tragedy that we've been... Following in, in recent weeks, Incorrigible FCA has just been in touch. So I'll tell you what, this is exactly the show I needed after the horrors of the last few weeks. It's an indication of how bleak the news has been that we're now essentially contemplating the despoiling and debasement of Britain on the altar of, of an ideology that nobody can really explain anymore. And it feels like light relief. Chris is in Chelmsford. Chris, what would you like to say? Hi, firstly, I've only ever contributed to Magical Hour, so this is my first time coming on here and speaking to you. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> welcome. To you. Um, James, yes. um, I'll come straight out and say I voted Brexit. Okay. Um, basically based on what you're saying is feelings and a feeling of patriotism, things like that. I wasn't really sure. I'm becoming more politically, politically aware, largely due to yourself in the last few years. Oh, thank you. The main point is, I've just returned from a uh, trip to Sweden for four oh, yeah. days. Now, this is the third time I've been to this country, a country we could learn a hell of a lot more about, from about politics, about everything, to yes. be honest. Um, I always speak to people. I'm an outgoing person. Um, three key people I spoke to out there, as many people I spoke to, but three that stick prominent in my mind was a student at the airport, and I got chatting to her. She was an English girl. She'd been out in Sweden studying marine biology near Uppsala mm. on an EU grant. Yeah. That's going to end. Boom, gone. Another yeah, exactly. Another person I spoke to, um, I stayed on this beautiful island. I won't go into the details. <laughs> the guy that owned the hut I was staying in, Hakan, lovely fella. Um, he's got children. He wants to send them over here to university because he believes our education system is good. He's worried about that. Now, the, another woman I spoke to, an ex, um, she used to live in East Germany. Now she lives in Sweden. Now, the point I'm trying to get at is they all came, this, this is the main three people I spoke to. There's yeah. seven or eight people I spoke to. Swedes are very friendly people. Perfect English as well. Embarrassing. Yeah, of anyway, um, they, all they kept asking me is, why the hell have you guys voted Brexit? Mm. And I couldn't answer it. Oh, mate. Even though I did vote Brexit, I couldn't answer it. <laughs> 
And I thought of fish, and that's why you're banging on about fish. And <laughs> it's not that, is it? It's not that. No. I think we've been forced to vote. We're a passionate nation. Yeah. I think we're, they've played on that. I think yeah. they've played on that. And I don't know why, if it's political gain. I see it in the elections these days. Well, really that, that's, that's the thing I'm not ready to do yet, is to wonder what the reasoning is. Because, is, is that, I mean, have we just all had a sort of a collective lapse of judgment? We've all gone temporarily bonkers. Or is there a master plan? And Because if there is a master plan, the master plan will involve removing regulations. And I think we've all had a fairly stark reminder in the last week of how important regulations can be. Exactly. And I don't know. I think a lot of people have been forced to vote with their heads. I think, you, you know, the, the, the older, the, she was maybe 85, sat on a tram, had a good conversation with her, again, perfect English, embarrassing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she said to me, why have, when you've done so much for Europe as a country, I mean, you, of course, we're going to, you have to reference the wars. Of course you do. We've done, we've done so much. And, the, and, and this wasn't just her said this, but she really made a strong point. She said, why, when Britain has done so much to rebuild Europe, do you now want to try and tear it all apart? And I said, I don't know. And I'm a, I'm a Brexiteer. And I, I'm, you know, you're bringing up the question, would I vote again? Yeah. Yes, I'd vote again. I'd say no now. I yeah. don't want to leave. Yeah, I, well, I, I, th I, think, I think that's probably something that is, is, is going to start gathering momentum, isn't it? Because the media narrative is still dominated by people with their fingers in their ears shouting about unicorns and fish. But normal people, I, I, I'd pick you and Tony and Harrow, actually. This is what happens when... I, I'm, I'm doing a bit of a mea culpa here, Chris. This is what happens when I talk to you with respect and affection, isn't it? Instead of yeah, I mean, battering I'm, you I'm, over the I'm, head with, a, with an old I'm, cod. <laughs> I I voted Brexit because I believed that things. I, I, I okay. It, to, to summarise, I thought, yeah, we're going to take a hit, but things will be better. But. I mean, you need someone I, to explain how. And Philip Hammond, of course, today has said that the British people didn't vote to be poorer or less secure. Michael Caine disagreed. Uh, one of the many reasons I love social media, Twitter in particular, is because of the unlikely encounters that you have on there. I, I got a message off the, the footballing legend Rodney Marsh the other day. I tweeted something about Brexit, I can't remember what. Um, and, and Rodney Marsh said, would, if, if, would you accept the result? If, if we had another referendum, would you accept the result, James? And I, I've never met Rodney, but he seems like a decent fella. I didn't bore him with the, with the definition of the word accept, because I, I don't know what that means. You accept the result, you can count. That was the result. But when the facts change, people change their minds. And as the last hour proved, um, anybody with their eyes open has seen the changing landscape. It may not have changed your mind, but if your eyes are open, then you are not where you were a year ago. A, a year ago, David Davis thought he could open up negotiations with Germany and bypass Brussels. He now knows that you couldn't. A month ago, David Davis thought that it would be the row of the summer to insist that the European Union allows us to negotiate the terms of our departure and our future trade deal at the same time. He was told yesterday that he couldn't and he had absolutely nothing in the locker in return. He just had to nod along and agree, which is fine. But, it, but no one can argue that things haven't changed. Things are it, it, I mean, unrecognisably different. So that word accept is a little bit odd. Um, what I wanted to do, but I couldn't squeeze it into a tweet, I wanted to say, well, it's a bit like a red card when you know you haven't fouled someone, Rodney. You have to accept it. But, you know, you know the video replay back in the day, there wasn't one. You know that you didn't touch the fella. He's gone over, he's gone, he's gone down like a, like, a, like a domino topple. He's gone down like he's made a paper. He's started screaming for the ref before you've even got within a yard of him. But the ref's fallen for it and he's given you a red card. Would you accept the red card? You have to accept the red card. The ref's in charge. Ref, referendum, referee. So that, that was my first response. My second response was, uh, I, I've said all along, it's a 10-point gap. It needs a 10-point gap. It needs a 10-point gap. It's amazing how many people on the Leave side were queuing up before the referendum result came in to say, if it's 52-48, we should probably have another go. I agreed with them. 52-48 would not have been satisfying. It would not have been a proper mandate. It would not have been the will of the people. It would have been the will of roughly half the people who bothered to turn up. So I'd say a 10-point gap, and then in answer to the question of whether you would accept it or not, well, once I've assessed the evidence, if I'm on an aeroplane and my fellow passengers have a vote and decide with a majority the will of the people to replace the pilot with a chimpanzee, then no, I'm sorry, I am going to carry on screaming that we've made a terrible mistake right up until the point that the chimpanzee flies the plane into a mountain. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't. Evidence. Facts. Evidence. Facts. So what are we doing and why are we doing it? 0345 6060 Peter is in Finchley. Peter, what would you like to say? Good morning, Mr O'Brien. I'd like to give you a fact. 
Um, I used to manufacture a product which depended on a pharmaceutical product that depended on gelatin capsules. The gelatin capsules were made in the factory in Kent. As a result of the EU, the, the factory was closed down. Why? Because, it, let me finish, please. The factory was closed down. The reason was because a factory was being opened up in Spain to manufacture the gelatin capsules uh, on the basis of subsidies supplied by the British government through the EU. So people in London, in England, lost their jobs. I lost a very good supplier of my capsules. And the people in Spain got their jobs on the back of subsidies from the British taxpayer. That is the reason one of the reasons I voted to leave. When, when, when was this, Peter, roughly? When? Yes. About uh, 15 years ago. And w was there anything to prevent you from buying your gelatin capsules from the Spanish supplier? No, I had to in the end. Okay. Because, it was, because that was the only source of supply. Incidentally, the and, price and went when up. And we, when we leave, of incident course. Incidentally. Okay, can you carry on, please? Yeah, because you've got plenty of opportunities, I haven't. It, what happened was that we had to buy the the product, the price went up, the minimum delivery went up, and the product range was diminished. Hello? Well, hang on a minute. You can't tell me off for interrupting and then go hello when I stay quiet, oh, no, Peter. No. Honestly, anyway, there's no so pleasing that, you. Can I talk now or no. not? Uh, so that, no. you, know, you asked me a question, I've given you an answer. Yes. Now, please... It continue the dialogue. Thank you, Peter. It's very, very gracious of you. So there was nothing to stop you carrying on. Don't be on sarcastic. By, no, it is very gracious of you to let me speak. I'm not being sarcastic. You're very, you're in a very bad mood this morning, Peter. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to pry. But is everything all right? That's my business. Okay. Well, the gelatin capsules that you were buying from Spain, when we leave the European Union, you would have to pay tariffs on them, would you? Uh, it, the, as a result of the increase in price. Uh, basically, um, I had to cease manufacturing completely, so I lost my. I lost so, my. So, to, to, to answer the question, if if you carried on leaving the European Union, the price of the gelatin capsules that became prohibitive would have gone up even further. Not necessarily, because I may be as a source. If if and it is if, because I must admit that I'm out of business, out of that business now completely. Yes. But probably I could have sourced the gelatin capsules elsewhere in the world. May I ask why you didn't? At the time, yes, because at that time it wasn't an option because the tariffs would have applied from the other other countries, and that's precisely what's going to happen when we leave. Well, not necessarily because no? I agree with one thing you say: our politicians here will mess it up. You've got people like Vince Cable who sold Royal Mail and underpriced, and now is the the bee's knees. You've got Gordon Brown who sold our gold at the cheapest price. 25 years, etc. The calibre of people we've got as politicians is rubbish. Mm. And funny enough, do you ever follow David Attenborough? I, I'm, I'm familiar with his work, yes. Yes. Um, they, he did a very interesting programme about swarm intelligence. And the general election is now proved be t uh, right. Because what the general election has proven is that basically, no... Nobody trusts any of the politicians here. What did the referendum yes. prove with regard to swarm intelligence, do you think? The, I, I think the referendum, again, was uh, a, a, a probably the right answer. And I'll tell you why, another reason why... So that was, the opposite, of, that was the opposite of swarm intelligence, then? Pardon? That was the opposite no, of swarm... No, swarm intelligence is where the majority make the right decision. Oh, I see. So the election so it, result. So the election result was the right decision, then? The election, in my opinion, the election result was a right decision because it indicates that people generally have lost faith in any particular politicians or party. So therefore, they have not given a mandate to any party, really. The same in 2010? Probably, yes. Yes. And the other thing is... I, 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 know, I, with respect, I am going to have to take some other calls now, Peter. Is that all right? Well, of course. It's your programme. You can you. do as you please. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I, I, hope, I hope your day gets better, my friend. 
It's 11 minutes after 11. Simon is in Brixton. Simon, what would you like to say? I know, yeah, I voted to stay in on environmental grounds. I thought a lot of uh, EU laws are to do with the environment and they encourage us to, to be green. But then looking into it further, I'm actually a bit more pro-Brexit now. Cause if you oh, look good. at EU law on biofuels, you know, mandating that we have to have palm oil in uh, our diesel, that has led to deforestation in a, in a big way in Indonesia. And I read uh, in an exciting journal, uh, Packaging News, um, France tried to ban uh, disposable uh, plastic forks and knives in restaurants and EU law overruled them because they were lobbied by the packaging lobby and I think this sovereignty issue for, based on things like that is, is really important and the second thing... Hang on, I just, just to clarify, the deforestation in Indonesia and not liking plastic cutlery. Yeah, that's... That, that, no, they're, they're perfectly good, <laughs> good reasons. Yeah, I, I mean... Where do you stand on gelatine capsules? Well, I don't know. I mean, it does sound a bit mean, doesn't it? If we're not allowed to subsidise gelatin capsules in the UK and then Spain does and then puts the British company out of business, that does seem a bit a bit wrong. But the Spain shouldn't have been allowed to get away with that, should they? If we're not allowed to subsidise industry in the UK, then Spain shouldn't either. But I guess they don't what, follow... What do you think the common agricultural policy is? Uh, well, I mean, that, that's a different issue. I mean, no, it's not. It's I mean, subsidies for the farming industry. Yeah, but that's universal. Every EU country is allowed to subsidise their farmers to a set level. We're not allowed to kind of subsidise one industry, say, uh, bottle manufacturing. Yes, yes, we are. Yes, we, we, we uh, well, all no, over. The car plants it, have EU subsidies all over Cornwall. There's industries that enjoy EU subsidies. North Wales, in particular, is one of the richest recipients, of uh, one, one of the uh, most biggest beneficiaries of EU subsidies. It's all like, But anyway, back to cutlery and deforestation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of people were like, even sort of charities like Friends of the Earth are leaning towards, yeah, let's stay in the EU because of uh, environmental law. But um, well, What do they know? <laughs> well, they are, they are experts, but if you... Um, well, we've had enough of experts. <laughs> I mean, coming, coming to my point, look, if you look, it was EU law that said, look, we must have 10%, in diesel, 10% of it must be biofuel, and that has led to people burning down rainforests to grow biofuel to meet the EU demands, which is set by EU law. I mean, I, it's been overlooked. I mean, the second thing about sovereignty, a lot of people go on about the Human Rights Act. I remember Amnesty International, but I actually disagree with some elements of the Human Rights Act. The right to family life is used by criminal lawyers to stop people being deported. I've heard that from the people in the office next excuse me, next door, they were criminal lawyers, and they said, yeah, if someone's being deported, we tell them to get their partner pregnant, and then they can't be deported. And I've heard that from a county court judge as well. Yes, and it, I think it, people it, it, are rightly is, annoyed with this. Well, it, and, and you can understand why. I mean, it, it, it would annoy me, but it's the problem with laws is that they're not perfect. So the reason why the, the right to a family life is part of the human rights legislation is so that if somebody commits a crime, you don't punish their children for it. Yeah, but surely then and, we and can that, you, and that, that creates a loophole, I suppose, if you can get yourself uh, pregnant or you can impregnate somebody in the nick of time. It, it, it creates mm. a loophole that would allow you to stay. But the loophole is the price you pay for innocent children not being punished for the crimes of their parents. And, and you're well, perfectly entitled to say, I don't care if the children get punished for the crimes of their parents. <laughs> but um, if you, well, for I, I, example, if you deport the breadwinner, from a family, and the the wife and seven children are British, uh, the burden falls upon the taxpayer. Well, I would say we should close that loophole by having a British Bill of Rights, which gives us all of the rights in the Human Rights Act, except for that right, and that would stop, that would close the loophole. Why not? Why not? We're, 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 we, every country has its own... What if, what if you didn't get, what if, how, how would you tell whether someone got pregnant by p accident or on purpose? Uh, that's an issue for the courts, isn't no, it? No, mate, it's an issue for you, because you just want to, you're the one that's writing the <laughs> new law. Cheeky, cheeky. Go on, then. <laughs> Um, okay, well, if I, if I, uh, if I was a lawmaker, it? if I was a lawmaker, I would say, well, if you have no children at the time of committing the crime, then uh, future children shouldn't be taken into account when considering your deportation. So the woman who's pregnant, who's never committed a crime in her life, is left not only holding the baby, but without any support whatsoever from the man who's impregnated her. Well, we have, we have benefits in this country, don't we? People... Yeah, that's fine, as long as you're clear that the taxpayer would be paying for that, as opposed yeah. to the father. I think the taxpayer paying for that would be ne that, and, that and, and of course she's, she's being punished. Being able to be de deported, I think fewer people would and do it. How many they people be do you think to do that? Would they? The criminal lawyers would be saying, "Get someone pregnant to stop being deported." That loophole wouldn't work. Well, Therefore, you need to tell me how many uh, how many cases there are of that happening where somebody's got pregnant between being being arrested and and being released. Um, I don't have the figures, sir. Because it's kind of what if it's three. 
You still want to re- you still want to leave the European Union to punish those three people, or those three innocent women, and those twenty one innocent children? Well, we do we do have we well, do three hundred. We do have welfare support for for mother, for fathers. So I'll do, children, so. I'll, 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 I'll do this to you. I'll I'll do this to you. I'm just pointing out that most people who who are very sort of pro deportation are also pretty much anti benefits but the, the, but you're clearly not, not and me. i like that yeah, but, not but here's, me. Here's, not here's, me. no not, not you but here's the question second referendum um yeah may i think i think maybe i think i think maybe i think people i, I remember this time last no, year, not right? that so I just but what would you do man in a second referendum well i think i think there, there's going to be two different options of, of brexit i think they'll be kind of leave everything or kind of have a bit of migration and send single market i think there'll be two options like that on the table from the eu but the and second option is what we've currently got it would just involve invoking powers that we currently enjoy but no one really told us about before the vote so if it, if it was another vote now what would you do um i i don't i, I don't know i don't know <laughs> i'd probably yeah, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't well, want. You've got to. You've got to vote. It's now. Seriously, the clock is ticking. I'm going to chuck I, you out of the, uh, of the voting hall in a minute. I'm going to chuck you out of the church hall. I, I, I think we. I broke, vote Brexit and hope there's another referendum on new terms to re-enter on better terms without these ridiculous rights to family life, which encourage women getting pregnant for. for that, no that, that is it for you. That, that's a man that you just can't get over that hump. And, and the, the and the palm. Why should France not be allowed to ban cutlery, plastic cutlery? I'll have to get back. No, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a. Should we say it's a slightly esoteric area of enthusiasm, Simon? Uh, Eleven seventeen. What are we doing, and why are we doing it with regard to Brexit? If you're just tuning in, I won't inflict upon you the catalogue of evidence for the prosecution, but it is. I think it's incontrovertible. Um, obviously, some people disagree, but generally, when pushed, with the exception of some sort of um, obvious uh, exceptions, like gelatine capsules and plastic cutlery, deforestation and um, deporting people who have families, it's kind of hard to see what the... What, 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 is, what is the uniting factor? What is it? When, when, when you know that everything that was said during the course of that campaign has turned out not to be true, pretty much everything that was said. It was within a week that they disowned the bus with the £350 million on the side. The bloke who ran the, the, the Vote Leave campaign, pretty clear that they never would have got over the line if they hadn't done that. That was the, the, the stroke of genius. He also said something about, about facts um, just getting in the way during this kind of campaign. But it's become clear since the Governor of the Bank of England this morning explaining how uh, precisely and, and intri intricately how Brexit has made us all poorer. Chancellor of the Exchequer this morning saying that nobody voted to be poorer or less secure, and that's what we'll be if we carry on on the current course. Um, of course he's wrong. Uh, people were telling me within a week of the result coming in that they had voted to be poorer. They knew the pound was going to tank. They knew all of this. They didn't believe Andrea Leadsom when she said that there'd be no economic impact whatsoever two years after saying that it would be economically disastrous to leave the European Union. It's almost as if opportunism played a part, isn't it? And then Michael Gove, of course, who thought that the country had had enough of experts. I don't know what his... Um, reaction is yet to the minister on the radio at the beginning of the week explaining how the reason why we couldn't act quickly over Grenfell Tower related problems because we have to let the experts do their work and then listen to what they have to say and then decide what our response should be. Experts back in fashion in some areas. But, but that's the question really. What are we doing and why are we doing it? Um, here's a text. Speak to the Metropolitan Police and ask how many pickpockets they arrest in one day in London. That may answer your question, Mr O'Brien. My question is, what are we doing and why are we doing it? OK, I will. I'll, I'll ask a policeman later how many foreign pickpockets they arrest in London. And that will... Mm, what? Oh, it's one of those days. 23 after 11. Dan's in St Albans. Dan, what would you like to say? How you doing, James? You are right? I think so. <laughs> just about, yeah. I just wanted to uh, pick up on your point about whether it's psychological or political, the reasons for leaving uh, the EU. I think I would actually argue that there may be many people who voted to remain in the EU for probably psychological reasons as well. Yes. I don't think it's necessarily a one-way street. Um, no, that's fair comment. Person, that's fair comment. Yeah, as, as, a, as a young person, I, um, I actually voted to remain because I, I believe immigration is a good thing. Um, I think free movement and free trade is great. Um, but lots of my sort of similarly aged friends voted to remain as well, but they didn't seem to have any particular reason for doing so other than a a general sense of community, a general sense of well-being. They couldn't really tell you much about the argument. So well, I, think that, that, I mean, a general sense of community and a, and a, and a general sense of well-being, I don't know that they...
file exclusively under psychology, psych, psychological motivations. They're, I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're yeah. beneficial. That's self-interest involved. And don't forget also the toxicity of the final days of the campaign left you with a very stark choice. Did you want yeah. to be? Do you want to be part of a movement whose rhetoric and propaganda almost certainly left Joe Cox dead, or do you want to be on the other side of the argument? But do you also think that um, both? both uh, in terms of the politicians, both Remain and both Leave politicians, actually appealed on the basis of emotion. I don't think the Remain ones did. I wonder whether they should have done it more, because they were constantly giving us numbers and, and, and predictions, a little bit of perhaps psychological manipulation when David Cameron pointed out that, that the European Union had probably played a part in continental European peace over the last decades but of course by the time that arrived in the daily mail he was predicting world war three he never did but that became that's psychological I mean. that's what i mean yeah it, world war three crumble of the nhs max ma, mass exodus of uh foreigners that here well, that's already that happening happened. it has been. is it yeah the, okay. i mean the, the 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 number of um nurses applying to work in this country from European Union countries has gone down by 96% in the last year. Yeah, nurses is a, is a pretty stark example, granted, yeah. And, 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 and the ones already in the European Union are leaving as well. And, and um, vets, veterinary crisis on the cards, a huge veterinary crisis, because oddly, and I didn't know this, it's another of the many, many things none of us knew before the vote, and the Remain campaign should have told us, no, no British trained vets want to work in abattoirs. They, they all want to sort of, you know, work with farm animals or, or cure kittens. So we, we have a huge number of Spanish vets, believe it or not, who, who, who right. people are... And I think that's in the... That's percentage, percentage rises in the 90s as well. And they're, they're obviously... And it's not just the fact that they might not be able to stay here. It's the message, and this is psychological, the message we've sent to them is... Yes. You know, it's not we that don't we don't want you... Want you we, well, that's the message they're getting. And then when you say, no, 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 we do want you here, we just need you to jump through these hoops first. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that that's going to be tough. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally think that it's, all the politicians from both sides did a poor job. Um, and when you... you well, know, no, the, the politicians on the Leave side did a brilliant job. It was just completely you, dishonest. Well, it was just completely dishonest. But in terms of winning being all that matters, they played a blinder. They managed to persuade 52% of people who cast a vote that black was white oh, yes. and night was day. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I just think they've done a disservice to the British people. Oh, that's think, a different I think, point. I think, yeah, I think both <laughs> both uh, both both sides performed particularly poorly on that part. I believe, but. Yeah we, yeah, we 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 let down, but that's the problem with a, with a binary choice like that. As as the guy who ran vote leave said, Dominic Cummings has written quite extensively and and uniquely, depressingly about about the tactics they employed. They knew exactly what they were doing. It's mm. it, it's uh, Dan. I'm going to crack on. It's eleven twenty-seven. Let's squeeze in Graham in Ponty Prig. Graham, what would you like to say? Morning, James. Well, uh, dealing with the psychology of it, and I've been a psychologist for a very long time now. Yeah. People seek psychostasis. A state called psychostasis. So that, that is a comfortable state of mind uh, that's without conflict. And they, people seek that all the time. This also goes to show the power of propaganda and gullibility for me anyway. Yes. But what they really want to avoid is a state called, called cognitive dissonance. Yes. And they need to close that dissonance gap. Now, no one wants to admit that they would do so do recons in this. So what they will do is that they will convince themselves, and you've had a couple on the show this morning, yes. who will convince themselves without any relation to facts whatsoever that they have done the right thing and the worst thing is that they would do it again. Uh, and the thing is, Graham, that if these are people that are ringing up a radio show like mine, that's fine. But if they're mm -hmm. actually leading our negotiations with the European Absolutely. Union, that's kind of scary. Absolutely, and you're right. And the thing is, you see, because um, you know the power of propaganda is so strong and it's, it's in the Daily Mail, it's in the Sun, it's in the Telegraph and other mainstream media, all day, every day, it becomes truth to them. But when they discover then that it is not truth, that it is actually that they have been sold unicorns and, and been sold a lie and down the river, they will do anything and everything they possibly can to convince themselves that they are right. Nobody wants to say I was wrong. There was a caller on earlier on, and I would take my hat off to him, who admitted that he was wrong. There's two, and he was to 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 Tony and Harrow and Chris, Chris just back from Sweden. And this is why, I don't know if you know this, but this is psychologically fascinating. This is why if you fall for a postal scam, if you send, you know, your life savings to mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, some fella on the internet who's, who's told you that he's discovered a, a, an oil well that you had a share in, mm -hmm. and your, your great long-lost long uncle, but you can release the 20 million quid if you just send me 10 grand by tea time. Um, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it's been shown that if you pay up once, you're more likely to pay up again. When they again. come back and say, oh, we just need one more check just to, just to you know, bribe the final official. That's, right. They'll, that's the same principle, right? Well, it is kind of, but it's the gambler. That's the gambler. Oh, okay. Because then the gambler is going back to the betting shop to make good his losses. But, but that refusal that, to accept, because all your family will be saying, this is a scam, this is a scam, this is a scam, but you're not going to go, yeah, it's all right, I've been conned, because you don't want to admit you've been conned. That's right. It will make no difference at all. And the thing is then, if they do win on the second occasion, they can turn around and point the finger at the family and say, they are told you so, I was right and they're all along. Yes, absolutely. Keep sending the checks to, to I don't know, Prince, uh, whatever his name is, who's uh, got the deeds to the oil well that your long-lost uncle had a stake in. Graham, thank you. It's half past 11. Um, it's a chap who is the British correspondent, the UK correspondent for the Polish press agencies, just sent me this. Um, it's from a Polish friend of his. So, yesterday, after 14 happy years in the UK, my fi family has finally left and returned back home. There is now one job vacancy, three NHS spaces, two school places, three dentist spaces, and a set of child benefits available um, in Hinckley. The relocation also contributed to the reduction of CO2 and congestion, as my wife's car will be scrapped. I hope all these stretched services are going to be taken by people who deserve it, but is now in the hands of David Davis to decide if people like like my family are allowed to or not. Saying that, I cannot get it into my head that if someone is deciding who and what rights citizens are going to have, this should have been granted and secured as soon as the UK expressed the wish to leave the EU. I wish him a fantastic negotiation, and I, but I am glad that my family won't have to be a betting card in this political game. Saying that, I am still in the UK, but we will be working towards joining my family back on the continent in the near future. We gained priceless experience, made some great friends, had a fantastic start in life for our children, but we traded our family lives, a lot of time, and our national identity. The last 16 months has made massive damage to my personal vision of life in Britain and opened my eyes to wider problems uh, than the existence of my own family. On the other hand, it has created an opportunity for making a decision which I wouldn't have made in any other circumstances. I'm not sure if I feel disappointed or thankful. Only time will tell. I just thought I'd share that because it's a, it's a slightly different perspective. And, I, and I'll share this as well because it will make you laugh. Um, I, I have technology in, uh, in the studio, which means I can click back over recent texts from the same person. Uh, so, here's one. Daniel's in Swindon. I voted Remain and if we had another vote, I would vote to leave. It is clear from the rhetoric of the EU that we are only a cash cow for them. Um, and, unfortunately, Daniel, exactly an hour prior to that, you, you, you tweeted, James O'Brien, you are a radical lunatic liberal. Why on earth would anyone need to justify Brexit to an idiot? You would rather we be controlled by communists and Muslims. You're a Britain hater, a terrorist sympathiser, and your views are offensive to Brits. So, Either you've undergone a quite incredible uh, double U-turn there, Daniel, or you're lying, or you're poorly. Uh, Jenny is in Surbiton. Jenny, what would you like to say? Um, yeah, hi. Uh, good morning. Um, Hello, I'm a first-time caller. You're very um, welcome. Although I've sat in the motor a few times and thought, shall I phone, shall I phone? And now you um, have. Right. <laughs> yeah. My... Um, my first experience, obviously, of the whole thing to do with Europe was when we voted uh, to be in the common market. The EEC came later. And in this common market, we were told that we were just able to dump our goods in Europe and the Europeans dump our goods into here. So that's fine. But as the time went on, we were not told we were going to be members of the United States of Europe. All right? well, does that, uh, what, what do you mean by that? And well, also, uh, before you tell me, what's the opposite of United? Well, precisely. Now, the thing is, hey? is that I blame not necessarily Europe, but our politicians. For, right? for what, Jenny? I don't, I don't understand what you're unhappy about. What's right. wrong with being united? N nothing at all. Right. Nothing at all. But my experience, uh, 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 which is really what I wanted to phone, was this. Yes. We've been self-employed, my husband and I, for 40 years. Right? And we've seen the whole of this gas industry change. The, what, the what industry? The gas industry? Gas. gas. Central heating. Yes. Gas, all right? Yes. So we were uh, bo bo both uh, uh, gas-registered engineers. Hmm. Now, as the time has gone on and the Euro Europe's uh, 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 doors were opened and people came uh, uh, across, um, some of them were extremely well qualified. But the legislation in this country states that if you come in from abroad, you have to work with a gas registered or whatever it was at the time um, engineer all right and then after 24 months you can then apply to be uh, your own uh, uh, a, a, a gas uh, safe engineer yeah. right now what happens is is that that the last, to give you some idea the last time i came across a correctly installed installation was in 2004 yes 
And what tends to happen is, is that I know probably some of it's uh, Joe Public's fault for taking the cheaper option on the estimate or quotes. But what we see is, is that they they come over from um, uh, uh, Europe. They work for 22 months. They then go back over to Europe for two months and then come back here. Yeah. Now, the ones that we have seen that have... Are the, are the so-called engineers that are here have got gas-safe registered numbers over a million, but we haven't actually got to a million gas-safe registers in this country. I, 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 I'm, I'm very, very, very sorry. I really am, but I, I, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Right, well, what happens is, is that if there is this, the legislation that exists, yes. why Europe hasn't fined us for this? <laughs> Right. But, but you phoned me up to tell me that they're too powerful, and now you're complaining that they're not powerful enough. And this is where the problem lies. You're telling me, for but it's years, not my problem, Jenny. For years we've been told... Hang on, are you, are you complaining that they're too powerful, or no, are no, you... No, 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 I'm just saying... So what did you mean by United States of Europe, then? This is our... Well, this, this is what's been quoted at the beginning. We were never... Yes, but it doesn't mean anything. No, I know it doesn't mean anything, I've... but we were told... We weren't told that we were going Whose to... Whose side are you on, woman? None, none at all. We weren't... <laughs> going, we, we were never told we were going to be that integrated... But, what, 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 but what does that mean? What, what is the integration... Which bit of integration don't you like? It, none, none, it doesn't bother me either way. Right, so you're, uh, you're, you're, second, you're second guessing the psychology of other people here. No, 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 no. no? My experience is obvious. Oh. My own experience has yes. been just on the central heating side and how it's gone down and how no, when you know, we used to talk about no, cowboy I mean, builders and cowboy tradesmen l l long before we blamed all shoddy work on foreigners. Yes. <laughs> Didn't yes, we? but this, this did get worse after the doors were opened. Um, so, but the thing is, is that if you look at it from, from, m m if you'd like to say, my point of view, which is my small, narrow, little life... It's no rubbish. We, There's nothing we, small we, or narrow or little about your life, yeah. but I, I can't understand what you're trying to tell me. I've got to be honest, it's probably my fault. No, 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 it's fine. Uh, uh, it, no. It, because, because this is the dilemma that we've got. Do When we tell our governing body, they say, oh, all they can do is just write a letter. You know, is it Europe that needs to do it? Because half of the Europe, uh, half of the um, European uh, um, uh, legislation uh, has come into the gas industry, all right? But it's not necessarily um, adhered to. Right. So who's responsible for that? And obviously we hear things uh, uh, such as uh, the, the uh, yeah. filthy air in London, and because we haven't sorted that out properly in a set time, we're going to be fine. Well, can the same thing happen with the gas industry? I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm giving up now. Yeah, sorry. That's all I, right. I, it's just... What, like, you, what are you having for tea tonight, Jenny? Anything nice? Uh, I don't know. No? But it's just our experience, which always ends up by coming I back when you talk I, to people. I, I, oh, I, it's I, the fault of the Europeans. Oh, help me. And it probably isn't. No, no. Ah! No, it's I think yes. you're probably right, yes, I think. And this is the what? thing. So although it's not my life, it may be, it'll be a narrow little life. Will you stop saying that? Why would you say that? Why do you know this is a se this is a sex thing, my, Jenny? My world is a very small world. No, but but you know, women ring me up, and they always yeah. say things like this: "Oh, I'm not really qualified," or "My world is no, this." No, no, no. Well, you say I'm a qualified gas. No, engineer. I'm not talking well, about being a that. gas engineer, woman. I'm talking about being qualified to talk about politics. And you ring me up and you say, "I've got this now," and then men ring me up and they're like, "Oh, I know everything about everything," and and yeah. it's much more fun to be honest because oh, you can make them look yeah. silly. Whereas <laughs> you've made me. Look silly. Everything in the gas in, in the in the um. I can't believe you haven't seen a correctly installed gas boiler since 2004, Jenny. No, I haven't. Well, have you reported have... them all? Yes, we reported them all. Well, who to? I mean, after a while, who to? Said, who did you report them to? If, if, to, uh, to, to? To our governing body. Well, there you go. It's their job. Yes. But then it still happens. Well, and they're not good. They're not fit for purpose. The governor, oh, governing body. Know. You need to get rid of them. You want to get your governing body back. Yeah. But when we do explain that, and I have gone up to Parliament and explained it, they changed it, but it's still exactly the same. And nothing gets done. So <laughs> is it something into that Alice Europe in Wonderland. could actually... Is, is it something that Europe could actually come in and say, right, OK... This is no, good. it categorically couldn't uh, at this point. You can't have European Union employed so, bureaucrats marching be. through your bedroom checking your gas boiler. But, of course, lots so, of people on the leave side have sowed the seeds. Yeah. That's why I got a little bit wary when you use the phrase... it's you, our MPs that yes. are the problem. It's yes. our governors yes. and our governing bodies that's a problem. And Give the woman us, a biscuit. They told us lies in the beginning, yes. lies all the way through. Yes. They were quiet and silent with the rest of it, and they've lied today. Yes. That was great. How was it for you? Uh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, 
do it again soon, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Great work yeah, from Jenny. Care. First class. God bless you. Stephen is in Billericay. Stephen, what's going on? Hi, Stephen. I'm uh, James. I'm a first-time caller as well. Um, I'm. I'm. I uh, thank you. Um, I voted to to leave, um, and I I would still vote the same way. And I voted. I would say politically rather than psychologically. Oh, good. Um, in. I, I'm not, I've not got loads of time, but but take as no, much. No, no. As, take, take go on, fill your boots. Sure. Um, in in our house, we're quite uh, divided. My my wife is strongly um, remain, and we've had many discussions about it. And I, I I'm one of these people who do the research. So I went out, and and the more I read, I mean, ultimately, I wanted to um, be in a reformed Europe. But the more and more that I read, the more and more um, and research, the more and more I found that 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 isn't really going to be possible. So, so first, first thing is, is the, the main reason... I did tell you I was short of time. You haven't said anything yet. Sure, sure. Thanks. Oh, okay. So, so protectionism, uh, that, that's, that's my, my first so, key okay. thing. The, 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 Which you can cast as either a negative or a positive. Protecting our economic yes, but, interests but, or damaging the economic interests of countries outside the Union. I agree. And, yes. and what I would like to see is that we, we as, as central countries within Europe, actually, you know, put more onus on the World Trade Organization so that we can have free trade globally so that everybody benefits rather than, you know, we had the common agricultural policy in the 80s and 90s, which, which meant that farmers in, in other, you know, non-EU countries were, were producing, you know, food that had 30% tariffs, um, whilst in Europe we had mountains of butter because farmers... Yeah, but were we don't anymore. Tired. No, we don't anymore. But then we move on to the next thing. We we joined the the European, uh, sorry, the, the the euro, which has we didn't caused join massive, the euro. No, 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 no. Sorry, the 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 European Union and the eurozone countries um, within the euro um, currency um, block, they they've caused massive contagion. They they let countries in. So Germany and France let countries such as Greece, Portugal, but Italy, we're not in the euro. Spain. No, we are we're not in the euro. But we ultimately um, are affected by those countries because of the contagion. And the reason. But we would be whether we were in the European Union or not. We're, we're well, leaving no, the European right. Union and we're heading towards parity with the euro. Well, well, but there's a, there's a bit of an argument there that we've just pumped in billions of dollars in quantitative easing, so effectively we're readjusting our currency to the actual value it is. And yeah, what you're to parity with the euro. But what you'll see in Europe, because they haven't revalued themselves and they're still pumping in free quantitative easing, that they will still have to go through that process. Inflation on the continent is insane. I went over, and it's not a currency exchange rate. A meal in, in Bruges was 144 euros for like a family of four. Mate, you, you, get it, you get it for 40 euros in, 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 in southern Spain. I mean, this is part of the problem, well, no, I think, no, is the no, lack of no, homogeneity. This is, this is the thing. We went, we, we've I been, am late for the travel, Stephen. Months. Again? I'm late. I'm late for the travel. So j j just to clarify, it's it's the fact that it penalises non-European Union countries, and the euro is is a is a sort of disaster. I've got loads of other stuff. I've got loads. Of, I, I apologise. You've got too much. You, you've got too much things on. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll ring again. No, well, I, I mean, give me your, give me a headline. Give me a, give me a, give me your greatest hit. Your favourite thing. If, 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 the thing that would persuade everybody listening that it, we're right to leave. I, I believe that contagion. That you know, just in the Grenville fire, the the closer that you you get, and and where you where you allow things right. that go yeah, negatively. See, I, that's the best you got, mate. And yeah, I look forward to the next call. It's eleven forty-seven. We we continue to sort of just query how we've ended up in this place, and it, it's not really a question of remain or leave, second referendum or no second referendum. It's it's a question of how anybody can not be. Sp Spooked to their pyjamas by the fact that the bloke leading our negotiations appears to understand less about the landscape and the negotiating process than your granny does. David Davis a year ago categorically stated that the first thing we would do after Brexit is go to Berlin to strike up a trade deal with Germany, something that we're not allowed to do. I found it quite funny when Angela Merkel had to explain that to Donald Trump 13 times. I do not find it funny in retrospect that the bloke who was subsequently appointed Secretary of State for Brexit didn't understand that in the final days of the campaign that he was instrumental in leading. That, that I mean, surely that's just incredible. It would be like finding we were going to the World Cup with a coach who didn't understand the offside rule. It just would be. And whether you supported that team or not, you would be... Tr you just don't want a coach who doesn't understand the offside rule. So here you've got a Secretary of State for Brexit who didn't understand the fundamental rule about striking up trade deals with European Union countries. You can't. You have a trade deal with the whole union, 
or there's no trade deal at all. So first of all, he didn't understand that. And then, and this isn't even about leave or remain, it's about personnel and knowledge and facts. And then a month ago, he stated categorically that the big row of the summer would be the European Union's insistence that we deal with the financial settlement and, and uh, sundry other issues before, so in other words, we determine the terms of our departure before we start negotiating any trade deal or any future trading arrangements. And he absolutely insisted, it was on Robert Peston's rather excellent television programme, he absolutely insisted that this was going to be the row of the summer and they wouldn't give an inch. Negotiations started yesterday, and by lunchtime we'd rolled over. And he's he's running the show. I mean, just, you know, if you're the most passionate lever on the planet, explain to me how you're untroubled by the fact that we're going to the World Cup with a coach who doesn't understand the offside rule. And who, right up until the first game started, insisted that we had the best striker in the world, but the striker ran onto the pitch and his shoelaces were tied together. It's actually incredible. And that's just one bloke. We haven't even mentioned the boss or Boris Johnson. It's incredible. This is just the, the, the laws of gravity are being denied. And the bloke who told Theresa May's government that this would happen yesterday, Ivan Rogers, they sacked him because, mm, crush the saboteurs. Enemies of the people. It's, it's just bizarre. So I'm really intrigued by the psychological political dichotomy. It seems to me the only way you can make sense of this, I, I, with a few glorious exceptions like gelatine capsules and um, plastic cutlery, the only way you can make sense of this is by seeing it as a psychological process, at which point it's the, uh, I don't know, I, I, I want to call them the grown-ups, not, not the ludicrous sort of, you know, the... the, the the ludicrous, self-serving, deliberately ignorant and misleading demagogues, but the grown-ups, the people like David Davis, that seemed going into this to be the people that, that those of us who weren't sure which way to jump would listen to. I don't want to be on the same side as the racists. I don't want to be on the same team as the breaking point posters. I don't want to be on the same team as the, as the kind of ignoramuses who are proud of how little they know but keep banging on about the United States of Europe or the EUSSR. But I'm happy being on the same side as someone like David Davis. If he can give me the gen, he can explain it to me. And now it would seem that, that, that he doesn't actually know what day it is when it comes to these processes. And that's terrifying. It would be terrifying if it was Peter Mandelson leaving our negotiations, leading our negotiations, and demonstrating in an absolutely undeniable fashion that he doesn't understand the rules. And then you just speak to almost anybody in continental Europe, and they'll just ask us what we're doing. Chris, just back from Sweden, earlier caller. We've got, what are you doing? And he voted to leave, and he couldn't tell them. Imagine what it's like for people who voted to remain. I haven't got a clue. My, one of my best mates, who voted to leave, lives in Gran Canaria. You sort of have, we had these weird exchanges before the vote where he was very, very detailed. He had wonderful, wonderful detail about what was going to happen. I haven't seen him since. I'm seeing him next month. I, I mean, there's part of me that's dreading it because he's just going to be sitting there going, oh, mate, I should have listened to you. I really should have listened to you. It's not, it's not looking great, is it? I, I don't know what the alternative was supposed to be anymore. What were the sunny uplands? What was that world where we could have our cake and eat it? Imagine a politician in a, in, a, in a properly functioning democracy saying in public at a time of epic national importance with a relatively straight face, as straight as Boris Johnson's face ever gets, actually saying to us, to you and to me, to leavers and remainers, to conservatives and liberals and Labour supporters and UKIPers, to, to actually hold us in such low regard that he, he could say to us as part of a campaign, we will be able to have our cake and eat it. And we all chuckled. That, that is almost like holding up a placard saying, I am a complete charlatan. I am a complete con, con artist. We'll be able to have our cake and eat it. It's, it's like a cliche. You, the reason it's a figure of speech, you can have your cake and eat it. You can't have your cake and eat it. It's a figure of speech because it's so self-evident. So he effectively stood up and said, the sun won't come up tomorrow. He effectively stood up and said, a rolling stone will gather moss. Too many cooks don't spoil the broth. You can have your cake and eat it. It's just bizarre now in retrospect. Strangest thing to explain to a... Future generations, when they say, what the hell, what the hell did you do? What were you thinking? The hardest thing, the weirdest thing to explain, it's probably going to be the open borders. And they'll say, but I, I, I've just read the regulations from that time, great-grandfather. And um, 
Uh, could I have another little bit of gruel, please, before I... Yeah, OK. Uh, so, great-grandfather, I've just read the regulations at that time, and we had full control over our borders. Uh, you couldn't... You could, the only thing freedom of movement means is that anybody from a European Union country can come here for three months. At the end of that three months, they've got to either have a job or they've got to be able to pri provide evidence that they're sufficiently wealthy not to be a burden on the state that they're living in. That is written down. It's there. And, and we're still going ahead. We're still doing this crazy thing. It's, it's, it's just fascinating. But it's not politics anymore. It's psychology, isn't it? Isn't it? Should we do another hour on this? Or have you, have you had your fill? I'll, I'll tell you what, I've got four fine lines free. It's been chock us into ten. If it's full by the time I come back from the news, we'll crack on for another hour. But you've got to have something too interesting to say. What are we doing? And why are we doing it? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. Otherwise, we'll find something else to talk about. That, that's just what I want to know. What is going on? And actually, if, if we're on different pages with this, could you just comfort me and explain why you're not bothered that the bloke leading the negotiations didn't know the most fundamental and basic of principles before he became Brexit Secretary? And on the first day of negotiations has capitulated completely on the thing that he said would be the row of the summer. Is, is there a snake oil salesman out there who's actually managed to get this one past the public? I mean, could we even cast it as a good thing? I, I'd be happy with ambivalence. Tell me why it doesn't bother you after this. And uh, I wrote it down, actually, when we were speaking to the fella in Ponty Prid, the, uh, the psychologist. Um, what was it? Cognitive dissonance and then psychostasis. Everybody's terrified of cognitive dissonance, uh, the sort of knowledge that you've done something that's wrong and you don't want to admit it. it it's often uh, used to describe people um, and their attitude to religion, the, the, the idea that you know it's a little bit daft to believe in sky fairies and what have you, but actually you like it. It's comforting. It's, it's nice. I, I mean, I, I probably fall into that category myself, but psychostasis is just a position of certainty, a position of confidence, and that's what confuses me. The, um, here you go, Andy in St. Albans. David Davis has a far better grasp of things than you do, James. You're such a cynic. That's psychostasis, right, Andy? Because, I mean, I've just explained to you that the fella didn't even know the most fundamental rule of trade negotiations. And uh, the first thing he said was going to be the battle of the summer was over in an hour. So, I mean, he doesn't have a far better grasp of things than me. Because I knew that you couldn't negotiate with individual European Union countries. And he didn't. I, I, but you just cling to it, right? You get that, yes, it's just right. What's going on? Why are we doing it? Rob's in Banbury in Oxfordshire. Rob, what would you like to say? Well, you're, you're such a hardened cynic, for uh, I know I am, mate. It's <laughs> terrible. Um, James, it, it's, uh, we, we, we could go into sort of why this all started and, and how we got here, but the thing that troubles me most is is that there's, there's no way out, and we're, we're, we're sort of we're marching on towards this. Out of and, embarrassment, essentially. And, yeah. and as you say, without any real majority, a 10% majority would have, been, would have been wonderful. Well, you'd have to suck it up, and you'd be able to get all hands to the pump, because you'd be like, well, I think you're daft, but hey, look, that's a 10-point lead. You can't argue with that. It's never going to shift. But if you, if, you, if you imagine for a moment that this wasn't talking about a nation, let's say we were talking about one man's liberty, and this was a, a criminal case, let's yes. say, for the sake of argument, in front of a jury, and the jury failed to reach an agreement, you'd get a retrial. Yeah. And if you look on, on... Or a hung jury, yeah, you're right, actually. 52-48, would be, well, what would it be? It'd be six, six against five with one, one uh, juror who refuses to make a decision one way or the other, and the judge would throw you out and come back with a new jury. Bingo, bingo. And, and that's my issue here, is, is if this was about one man's liberty, you'd get a retrial. It's about the future of a nation, and we don't. And if you look through uh, what the CPS note down as their principles for a retrial, it's... It's almost astonishing how many of them have links to what's going on with Brexit. If you look at, at the failure of a jury to agree a, a verdict, yeah. one of the reasons that comes up is, is there a suggestion that the jury was influenced by factors other than the evidence? Boom. But you know what we think about judges now, remember? Don't, don't you read the Daily Mail? <laughs> They're enemies of the people, Rob. But this is, I mean, this, this is the thing, and it's, and it's, and it's astonishing. There's, there's another one, one of, the, one of the very basic principles. Um, a retrial following a tainted acquittal, for example, by intimidation. How, how was there not intimidation in the, as, as we've now seen, lies that were, were, were put forward? Mm. In, well, in Project the Fear was an act of intimidation, Call, calling it Project Fear. A very forgive. serious offence, a very serious offence when new and compelling evidence comes to light. How, how is that not where we are right now? If you're an individual, you get a retrial. If we're a nation, we don't. And how, and how is that right? I, well, like, you know, I'm not going to argue with you about that. But the, um, the, the, the question is, 
who would have to lead that call for a retrial. It's no good coming from people like you or me. Who, who would have to... Um, who could change the game, do you think? I don't know. Do we go to the European Court of Human Rights? No, I'm thinking it would have to be, it would have to be a prominent, a proper grown-up prominent leave politician, wouldn't it? Would have to say, look, chaps, I'm terribly sorry, I've made a boo-boo. Yeah, but that's never going to happen, is it? I, I mean, I you know, and, it and, 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 and here we are, stuck on this marching towards a hard Brexit, when even those pushing towards a hard Brexit were the ones who, in the run-up, said, well, if we have Brexit, it's never going to be legal, leaving the single market. We just, you know, we just want to get rid of regulation. And it's just, it's, it's, it's lies compounded by lies. I, you know, I voted to stay, but I'm not, I'm not upset about that. I'm upset that... You know, even if we had another referendum now and people still voted to leave because they, 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 they wanted to leave, fine, accept that. But go into it with all of the evidence that has come to light over the past 12 months because we're in a better position now to make an informed decision than we were 12 months ago. Well, that seems self-evident. But again, I, I'm back to the psychological rather than the political question of how anybody could deny that. I mean, I, I'm very lucky. I take mostly calls from sort of thoughtful people. So they will say, I voted leave, and I didn't know that. I voted leave, and I thought this. But now I get the text coming and say, actually, I did vote to be poorer. So how do you deal with them? I don't have an answer for that. And it's, and it's the worrying thing, I think, with, with where we're going with this, is that there are, there are so few answers to so many big, seemingly obvious questions that people are either refusing to give or unable to give because they're sticking their heads in the sand, particularly those who are in a position of very um, very sketchy power, shall we say, at the moment, because it is such a, well, not even a majority, but, a, you know, a minority government based on, on or predicated on give me a majority. Well, you didn't get it. And now everyone's sticking their head in the sand because to, 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 to rock that boat even slightly shakes the, the very basis of... Well, a majority they don't have. and, and It's, and it's actually it. surreal. If, if Jeremy Corbyn wins six seats, he will be Prime Minister and lead the European Union negotiations. That, that was what she said, categorically, if, he wins six, if we lose six seats. And, and she lost 13. Actually, it's a point taken up by Matthew. I enjoyed that sound of you drinking your tea, Rob. It was, it was most, most illustrative. <laughs> Thank you. And I love the analogy of a retrial. There's new evidence. There's new evidence. No, can't have a retrial. The will of the people. The will of the... But there's new evidence. I found the gun. I found the gun. Or, it turns out the gun doesn't work. The gun that we convicted on last time, it doesn't work. It's made of chocolate. We've got a chocolate gun. We've convicted a guy with a chocolate gun. Have a retrial. No, can't have a retrial. Crush the saboteurs. It's a chocolate gun. Seriously, writes Matthew in Bexley Heath. What is going on, mate? Don't ask me, mate. We still don't have a government, do we? Do we even have a PM? I've barely seen or heard her since the general election. Brexit is a joke. No deal is worse than any deal, should be the motto. Davis is clearly clueless and Europe are laughing in our face. They're not, mate. Europe aren't laughing in our face. This is the thing, again, to go back to the Daily Mail, which I appreciate looks like it's lost some of its power. The, the, the story, if you're lucky enough to know anyone who was there, the story of Paul Dacre's departure from the editorial floor at 10.02pm last Thursday. Um is just quite beautiful. They had a lovely front page all printed up with a union flag on it, and it was all, now we get on, well done, Mrs May, now get on with Brexit or something like that. And then the, the opinion put the exit poll dropped. And uh, it's a good job his chauffeur is on permanent standby outside the office. But, you know, we should... So here it is. It let the battle commence. You silly people! Even now, let the battle commence. Team Brexit square up to their Brussels adversaries. The, the Brussels adversaries are essentially bending over backwards to, to sort of suggest, to suggest, are you sure you want to do this? And, and if you do want to do this, let's try and do it in a way that's best for all of us. And yet the Daily Mail have still got it cast as a sort of game of battleships or something like that. It's quite, quite surreal. And um, you literally can't write this stuff, Matthew continues. It's like a political sketch from Monty Python. Another one, I'm sorry, but I, I really do feel, this is Jim in Mitchum, like I'm taking crazy pills. It's obvious that no one knows what they're doing. Those who, who cheer for Brexit either can't, can offer nothing but rhetoric, no solid facts or action plans. I truly feel that, that that's why they were banging on about not showing their cards before the negotiations, because they didn't have any. The EU have published every single detail of their position. Am I mad, says Jim from Mitchum. No, Jim, you're not. You're, you're, you're the boy in the crowd, pointing. Actually, there's loads of us now. The emperor is naked. The emperor, no, he isn't. Cross the saboteurs. The emperor is naked. Cross the saboteurs, enemies of the people, fish. Chris is in King's Cross. Chris, what would you like to say? 
Yeah, hi. Um, first time caller, so very easy on me. Always, Christopher, uh, always. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, like, vote to be poorer. Uh, for me, I just feel like I'm, I'm just a normal guy. You know, yeah. I go to work. Um, you know, I have to put petrol in my car. So when they're saying poorer, to me, it has to be palpable to me. Yes. So, you know, it's like, if I'm going to put petrol in my car, I can feel it that way. If I'm going to go to the shop, I'm going to go buy bread and things like that. Um... It's got to be purple to me. Yes. So when when they're saying poor, I don't really understand. I don't really get that. Is that maybe? Yes, I do. I mean, there, there, there are. I mean, simply put. The, the the performance of the pound against other currencies affects yeah. what you can, how much it will cost you to buy stuff that's come from overseas. So if the yes, pound, if yes. the pound goes down, anything you want to buy for, from you know American root beer to German sausages and and obviously much bigger ticket items as well. That that like American yeah. computers that's that's going to go up in value. There's there's yeah. an added there's an added problem also of the possibility post Brexit of whatever trading arrangements we have involving tariffs. So mm. if if you want to buy something that's coming in from those other countries, not only is your pound worth less than it was before we left, but you also have to ac accommodate the tariff onto what, the, what you're spending. Then you've got... Um the problem of uh, low growth and and sort of yeah. pay pay and income not moving because your employers can't afford to give you a pay rise and if inflation moves ahead of the average pay rise then you're losing money yeah. every year. So, so those I, I, are the ways in which you could and I'm afraid to tell you almost certainly will be poorer. I, I understand that, but to me, I feel that that maybe um, relates to people that own companies and things like that. But to me, I I've just, just to told you, you want to go and buy a can of Coke, it's going to cost you more if it's come from a canning plant in Berlin. And, and yes. a pound in your pocket is worth less. Just go to the Bureau de Change. You don't have to be Alan Sugar. Go to the Bureau de Change okay, and okay. See, what, see what you get a pound for. See how many euros you get for but, a pound. But what I don't understand is, if we had somebody that was um, representing the beef, and he was able to be, you know, um, uh, express himself in a way that could relate to people that I felt, like the general person. If you've got, like, the media that's out there publicising and putting out negative um, negative things, let's say, um, if you're, on the, say, working on a building site, you're going to see, like, if there's a lot of people coming in from different countries and, and then uh, you have to work for less money. Do you understand what I mean? So I, I, I do, I, but the Bank of England has published... Whereas, a go, carry on. Where, Whereas the Remainers, they wasn't putting out, they, their arguments didn't seem to be that strong. Do you understand? Do you understand? Their well, I understand perfectly what you're saying, but it, it depends what you mean. I mean, if, 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 you're, if, you're, if we're going down the immigration route, then you were let down by people on the Remain side who didn't explain to you because they couldn't, yeah. because they were the politicians responsible for not enacting the rules that we could have enacted. So the, the, the immigration thing since 2005 has been weaponized, and history has taught us for centuries, for millennia, yeah. that once you've, once you've weaponized xenophobia, once you've weaponized the fear of the foreigner, whether he's coming over here and stealing your women or whether he's coming under here and, and undercutting yeah, your yeah, wages. Yeah, yeah. Once it's weaponized, mate, we will we will punch ourselves in the face in the belief that it's going to make things well, better. Exactly, and I, I feel that the the, the remainers they, they didn't put out a, a strong enough um, campaign, and it's their fault why we're in this position. And I believe it's the government's fault why we're in this position. Like that, the public are saying. I think all these things that are happening right now, um, the, the, the public have just basically had enough. We're just we, I think we've just had enough. So we're in a bad position, but they cause it. They cause this bad position. So well, yeah, them, I, I, I mean, I'll out. come with I'll come with you halfway down that road because you, you voted leave, right? And you and you put it at the to feet. Honest, I, didn't, I didn't actually have a I didn't actually have a vote to be honest with you. But okay. I would have voted. I would have voted to remain. Oh, all honest. right. I would have voted. I would have voted to remain because I don't really know. I didn't really understand the whole leave and remaining thing anyway. So I thought, you know what, just stick to what we know. Nor did I. Really. Nor, nor did I. I don't know anyone who did. Really. I don't know anyone who who knows. Who, who knew as much then as they do now? Not a single person. Yeah. You, you either you, you're either still ignorant or you know a lot more. No, nobody is, is less informed than they were then. Yeah, but it doesn't fill me with confidence to know that the person that's going up to do the negotiations doesn't seem to know that much neither. Well, I've got a couple of texts. I don't know if anyone's actually rung in to make this argument, but I've got a couple of texts saying it was a really clever negotiating tactic and he only pretended that, uh, that he didn't understand things that were going on to wrong foot Michelle Barn. That's sarcastic, surely. Yeah, well, as, well, you know, I, I, I think I feel like I'm being a bit cynical, but as I say, I do believe this country is a is a complete mess. Everything that is going on right now, all these killings, and 
you know, the Grenfell Tower, everything. Well, you're, 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 you're packaging an awful lot of stuff together, but I don't, I don't think that you're wrong to do so necessarily because it speaks of a national mood. It speaks of a national sense of crisis and my goodness me it calls out for strong and stable leadership doesn't it it's 12 16 and that line from mark carney this is a governor of the bank of england one of the most respected central bankers on the planet but we've created a country in which he gets abuse for understanding stuff and david davis gets cheered all the way to the negotiating table for essentially not understanding stuff and Mark Carney, just talking about Boris Johnson here, before long we'll find out the extent to which Brexit is a gentle stroll to a land of cake and consumption. Picking up on that one line that for me is a real tombstone, that idea that someone could say to us, to the, to the great British public, someone who seeks to lead us could stand up and say to us, you will be able to have your cake and eat it, and we didn't laugh him out of town. What, what are we doing and why? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Um, I find you some examples. They, I mean, they, you just, yes, the last caller did just say that people campaigning to stay in the EU are responsible for us leaving, but it doesn't merit eighteen question marks. Whoever sent that text in, I think it's quite a valid point. I think there was a huge failure of leadership on the on the Remain side, and, and I, I know I've used this line a million times, but it is my own, so you'll you'll indulge me. They turned up to a knife fight with battered old boxing clubs and a, and a copy of the Queensbury Rules. Um, James, get real. Do you really want to be part of an organisation that is destined to go down the toilet in time? Look at Greece, Italy and Spain. Um, I think they're all outperforming us now. Have faith in your country, for goodness sake. Come 2019, you will surely be proved very wrong. I, mate, I hope so, Richard, but that's just blind faith, you realise. And I'm just wondering about what, what, what the new lies would be. What are we replacing the bus with? What are the new lies doing the round? It's not necessarily a lie to say, I want to leave because the European Union is going down the toilet. Um, you, you may well believe that, although uh, the evidence of European politics at the moment suggests... Suggests the precise opposite. Um, what's the other one? The, the, what's the, there's another big one. That's it. The reciprocal rights thing that they're negotiating at the moment. The European Union said in April they would happily agree right now to full reciprocal rights. In other words, every British citizen living in the European Union would be able to retain their status and every European Union citizen living here would be able to retain theirs. They offered it in April. Uh, that Categorically categorically that was offered in April and we, we said no, we, we wanted to take it into the negotiating strategy so that rendered three million of our neighbours and friends and partners and lovers and colleagues and wives and husbands, three million of them immediately rendered a bargaining chip that, that's just fact, that's what they were and the European Union said well maybe we won't use these people, these humans these wives and husbands and fathers and sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and cousins and colleagues and friends, maybe we won't use them as bargaining chips, maybe we'll respect their humanity and agree right now that their rights are off the table they're, they stay as they are, they, they, they continue with the lives that they're leading and we said no and they haven't really told us why and then you get texts like this There isn't a quite, I just do my little trick of checking what this person has sent in in the past um, there isn't equality, no, it's the, I haven't got any others, there isn't equality between British and EU workers. EU workers get £10,000 per year for free for working less than 34 hours a week. They can also get £1,900 per year per child benefit. They can send that to their own country. They also get their housing costs paid. Mate, I, I mean, this is like the text, the emails I used to get when I first started here in the BMP were, uh, having a bounce and, and people will send me emails saying my local council will give you £25,000 to start a business if you're an immigrant but if you're indigenous you don't get anything and I'd read them and I used to laugh so I mean that's smug liberalism thinking that stuff like that was so obviously bonkers that it can't possibly appeal to any but a tiny tiny minority of bonkers people but we are where we are um, so you can earn £11,500 per year before tax and that's why they're attractive to employers and can undercut British workers and keep wages low Cameron tried to include the housing benefit in the £10,000 they all received, but Europe said no. That's why Britain is so attractive to the EU um, uh, people and so unfair for indigenous people living in Britain who cannot claim this work top up. And Tony Blair is responsible for this and why he had to leave and why we had to leave the EU. P.S. If you do not believe me, it's all on the government website. Thanks, Mark. And, and, and that's the point, really, isn't it? I, do you want to go down the toilet and foreigners get £10,000 for free? And uh, lots and lots and lots of other stuff. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Joe's in Wandsworth. Joe, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, I hope Joe. you're going to fly nice with me. Always, Joe. Always, <laughs> Mr. <Cubby>. Um <laughs> Right. Um, right. I'll lay my cards on the table. Um, I voted leave. Yes. 
um, prior to the 2015 election, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of history. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a London black cab driver, yeah. and I'm a fat, middle-aged white bloke with crew cut. <laughs> so I had a lot of people that would get in the back of the cab <laughs> and would instantly decide that I was a UKIP supporter. Right. Right, and I would say to them, look, no, don't vote UKIP, vote Conservative. Yes. Because then you will get a referendum, and then, and this is where my plan fell down, <laughs> we will get an intelligent debate about the EU. So anyway, we, you know, history's gone past, and obviously there was a massive flaw in my plan. So I then went off and researched it myself. I thought, well, if nobody's going to tell me, I, I put up two criteria. One, if you can't give me a cogent argument to stay, then I can vote leave. And the other need is I, I actually went off and researched the only other United States that I know of, which yes. is kind of what the EU is, which is the United States of America. Yes. And I talked to Americans, and one guy said something that really stuck in, in my head and set off the bell, basically. He said that Bill Clinton, when he was governor of Arkansas, used to say, thank God for the Mississippi, for Mississippi. And when he clarified, he said, Mississippi is the weakest state in the United States, and Arkansas is the second weakest. Yeah. And the federal government plows money into it to make sure that the people have living standards and hopefully work and whatever. And I juxtaposed that back over to what the EU yes. is and was doing to Greece. And I'm afraid I have this thing in my head that you can blame governments, but you can't blame people. Right, you can blame the people at the top, which is you could say with Greece they weren't collecting the taxes. Okay, the people weren't paying them, but they weren't really making an effort to collect them. And they're quite prepared to write off to my mind, a whole couple of generations of Greek people because of what their government did. Instead of piling money in there, they're taking money out or they're giving them sort of loans. Nobody seems to be prepared in the EU to take a haircut and say, yeah, we got it wrong. We're going to have to wear that. Well, what do you, you mean? Know? What would wearing it look like? You cut the loan. You just have to sit there and say, look, we gave you that money. We should not. It's you, not It's not really theirs to, to, to surrender, though, is it? Because I mean, the, the money that they've lent isn't... I mean, it, it, the central banks and other banks have been involved in that process. But you mean just... And yeah. Also, if you write well, off the loan... If you, if you can have quantitative easing to take yes. banks out and whatever, then there's absolutely no reason why you have to punish people. You can sit there and say, yeah, OK, your government have got it wrong. We're putting in a government, you know, which they did. But instead of sort of saying, and you're all going to lose this and what... I mean, obviously you had to lose some... But there's, you know, I mean... The, the, the problem is, uh, and I know Greece quite well, it's, 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 a, mm. it's a country I love, and I, I have Greek friends, um, uh, and, mm. and I, they will all tell you that Greece's economic woes are caused essentially by an incredibly... Um, what word can I use that's kind? An incredibly eccentric attitude to personal taxation. So... Oh, yeah. no, no arguments from me there at all. I'm, I'm trying to explain to you how I arrived at voting. OK. Right. So, so you didn't like the European uh, Union seeming to strong-arm Greece when they could have yeah, essentially I, 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 thrown, I, thrown good money after bad and... Uh, no, not good money after bad, but do something for the actual people. Yeah. You can punish yeah, you can punish a government. I mean, to be honest, you could you could lock up most politicians as far as I'm concerned. Um, <laughs> but, but you but you you, you shouldn't. It, we're we're already having this discussion about how we've been led down a path by politicians. Yes. And I'm looking at the Greek at the Greek people as a whole and thinking, well, the same kind of thing happened to them. Okay. So I think the EU, if it's you have to because it's a, it was a long journey for me. Yes. Um, you, my viewpoint is the EU should have said, yeah, okay, yeah, we really need to have a word with this group here because, you know, you've just been really, really stupid. But yeah. what can we do for the collateral damage? Okay. And they kind of made the collateral damage worse. Now, I'm halfway down the road to Damascus. Right. Because... We're going to run out of time. Shall I come back after okay, the news? I'm sorry? sorry? Can I, I'll come back after the news. Yeah, uh, yeah sure. I, yeah. Li I like the way you tell a story, actually. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the back of your cab. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to be there at all at the moment. I've had to turn the air <laughs> You should come into this studio. I can't turn it down. I'm freezing my... It's half past 12. 33 minutes after 12. It, it, that, that thing I said a minute ago, some of you still don't believe it. You can Google it. The European Union have published their negotiating strategy, and in April they said, let's have full... Re what's the word, Theo? What's the word? Reciprocity. Reciprocity. Pardon? Reciprocity for all EU citizens living here and all British EU citizens living there. It's there. You can read it. It's in black and white. But I guess that's kind of what we've spent 90 minutes talking about. You're being psychological. You just don't want to believe that that's true because it, it just quiz the pitch of your support for Brexit. It just is true. But that's me being all factual and political. Um, Theo is going to 
give us more than just that single word, but Joe's halfway through his story. Where were we, Joe? We lost Joe. Did no one check that Joe was still there? He probably got a fare. Did he? Is he hello? Still, hey, hello, Joe. Ah, sorry. I think he put himself on hold. That's right. <laughs> Don't worry. Where were we? Can you remember? I'm a love -like. I've got, I've got, um, I've got Theo in the studio. He's, he's, he's a very important man. I can't keep him hanging around forever, Joe. Okay. Anyway, so the other thing, when is it, it just before it, they said they had no plan for Brexit, which obviously was quite a big alarm bell for me. Yes. So anyway, so it was the green. So I did as much research as I could, and I voted Leave. Right. Because I thought you haven't put a cogent argument together for me to stay. Yeah. It was a appalling campaign. Oh, shocking. Well, since then, I can hear the water circling round the pan. <laughs> as the, uh, <laughs> the plan becomes more and more apparent and a strong and stable government mm -hmm. literally exploded in the most spectacular way possible. We got our country back, fish. Oh. And, um, and I wasn't really that... I wasn't I never fussed about immigration or blue passports or whatever. It was just about good government, yes. which I didn't feel the EU was, EU was doing. And I felt we need to get it into a place where we can control our own politicians which, again, turned around and bit me on the bahookie. Um <laughs> So now I'm finding that I'm kind of... The best way I could describe myself is I'm like Schrodinger's voter. Yes. If you put me in the box, I'm really I'm completely uncertain which way to go, because it's kind of... My other fear is, is if we voted yes and stay, or if we go back in now, there'll be a massive acceleration on everything they're trying to do. And I, I think the opposite, but I can't. I can't prove that. I think. I think this has been a wake-up call. The best case scenario, if we did go back, if we changed our mind, would be that it, it, that, that Europe then the European Union then changes it in ways that it probably hadn't recognised until this. This it got this shock to the system. But remember, France and Germany have, have, have seen support for the European Union strengthen since we left. Yeah, my my only concern with that one is having just seen the because you can only kind of a, sort of compare like we've got having just seen what our politicians have been doing. I sort yeah. of look at the EU and think, well, they're really not better. Yeah, they're they're, they're kind of just another version of what we've got. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm kind of trapped in this situation at the moment. Have you ever seen the Buster Keaton movie, The General? No. Where, where he's walking up and down, and it's the Federal and Union forces on either side. He's fighting in the Civil War, yeah. and he finds himself walking down a railway line, and every time he turns to one, one side, the other side all raise their guns. <laughs> and as he steps out, they all raise their guns. I really feel like Buster Keaton at the moment. I'm just sitting there thinking, either way I go, I'm going to get shot. I don't envy you. Do you want another vote? Yes, but I'd really like a proper grown-up debate, which probably doesn't involve any of the people we've got in power at the moment. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I mean, to actually have it conducted by civil servants or conducted by... Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, or, I think... or actually or have, have the leave people on one side and actually have the EU fetch up and fight their side of the game. To side. Yeah, but they're, they're, I mean, we are part of the EU, so I think one of the big problems is that we've we've treated the European Parliament with contempt for years, whether we liked the idea of the European Union. Why haven't we been sending proper talent and quality to, to, to the European Parliament? Why haven't we been trying to influence policies more? Why have we elected all these Herberts in bow ties and ludicrous tweed suits who boast about the fact that they never vote for anything? It's, it's actually madness. Well, it's unfortunately because we keep sending Jim, Jim Henschel's workshop over there, don't we? <laughs> we do send a, a barrow load of Bob Muppets. I like your cultural references. I've got to crack on, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> that was all right, wasn't it? Was I gentle enough? Yes, yes. I've, I've come back. Uh, my heart rate slowly goes. Right, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Theo Ashwood's heart rate is constant. He's here to bring us up to speed with political developments today. And am I right, I'm right in thinking that, that there's been some quite momentous interventions this morning, although such is the weirdness of the media landscape that newspapers tomorrow will be pretending that there hasn't? Let's start with the Bank of England Governor Mark Carney. Yes, a significant uh, perhaps would be the right word. He kicked off proceedings at the Mansion House this morning. His focus was on the impact of Brexit uh, on the economy. A weaker pound, more expensive imports, inflation. We saw that last week... Uh, when the consumer price index hit 2.9%. Of course, the government's target is 2%, but of course, the governor cannot ward off higher inflation with intra interest rate rises because the economy is too weak. Looking ahead, Mr Carney said we would uh, soon understand the full impact of Brexit. Depending on whether and when any transition arrangement can be agreed, firms on either side of the channel may soon need to activate contingency plans. And before long, we will all begin to find out the extent to which Brexit is a gentle stroll along a smooth path 
towards a land of cake and consumption. But whatever happens, monetary policy will be set to return inflation sustainably to target, while supporting as best it can the necessary adjustments in the economy. A land of cake and consumption, of course. That's a dig at Boris Johnson, our foreign, foreign secretary. Who... Why, why does it take a Canadian central banker to point out that for an elected politician to look voters in the eye and tell them they can have their cake and eat it is like the definition of dishonesty and deceit? A year on. A year well. later? A year on. Uh, two key bits, I think, that mm. I picked out from that. Uh, interest rates uh, will have to be used if we continue to miss our inflation targets. So what Mr Carney was saying there at the very end is if we don't hit inflation targets, we can't just simply ignore it. We're going to have to put up interest rates, and obviously that's going to have an impact uh, on people's mortgages if you put the base rate up. The second thing he talked about, transitional arrangements. Uh, Mr Carney clearly believes that these will be in place and that will uh, ca cause many Eurosceptics within the Conservative Party to get very uptight and angry because they'll see that as a move towards uh, a watered-down uh, Brexit. Of course, transitional arrangements will exist to ensure that we leave the e European Union at a gradual pace rather than uh, just crashing out. Well, why, why do Eurosceptics not like the idea of... of acting cautiously carefully and and i mean what what what, what is because this is the bit i don't quite get it's what we've been talking about all morning it seems psychological rather than political but it, the no deal is better than a bad deal line that theresa may used to try and mollify them it, it we, we can't i mean we can't just cut our arm off and the, walk away no deal and is better than a bad deal and then transitional and yeah. then and then and then moving and then not having transitional arrangements are slightly different uh, with no deal is better than a bad deal you crash out and then it would just revert to world trade organization rules uh, no transitional arrangements could exist and we could still have uh, a deal uh, the key part of that of course was uh, and this came yesterday when michel barnier the chief uh, negotiator for the european union uh, said that he uh, wouldn't accept what Britain wanted, what David Davis wanted when it came to the negotiating strategy. David Davis wanted to negotiate a trade deal at the same time as the divorce. Michel Barnier won that argument and said you can only negotiate a trade deal with the European Union after you've negotiated migrants, uh, borders at Nor with Northern Ireland and the Republic um, and, uh, the, and the divorce bill which could hit 100 billion, uh, 100 billion euros, I should say, because of course that's going to put more pressure on David Davis towards the latter end of the negotiations, James, uh, to do a deal. If he can't do it, then we're going to simply revert to rules. On the subject of Philip Hammonds, mm. this was perhaps the most pro-European speech by a British cabinet minister since last June's referendum. I've said before, and I remain clear today, that when the British people voted last June, they did not vote to become poorer or less secure. They did vote to leave the EU, and we will leave the EU, but it must be done in a way that works for Britain, in a way that prioritises British jobs and underpins Britain's prosperity. Anything less would be a failure to deliver on the instructions of the British people. Now, if you need cheering up, I have something to cheer you up to show that the mood, the mood has, uh, <laughs> has shifted because Emily Thornbury, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, mm. said exactly the same thing in front of a studio audience uh, last October. This was the reaction. Let me ask it this way. I mean, how many people here voted to take their next door neighbour's job away? Because the truth is... No, 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 that is no, ludicrous. Because the truth is, the truth is, that is ludicrous. First of all, it's its primary responsibility, the safety of its people, and its secondary responsibility to make sure that we have a decent economy. The person heckling in the background, ludicrous, uh, was Isabel o Oakshot, who, of course, was uh, editor at large at the Daily Mail at the time of that recording. She's no longer at uh, that post. Um, and she wrote the book alleging that David Cameron had done things to a pig as well. Yes, she did write that. She did write that book. Yeah, and uh, you talked about why David Cameron perhaps wasn't believed. It's worth noting that that book came in the September. We lost the referendum in the June. And I noticed, and I think many of my colleagues noticed, that when David Cameron appeared on in front of studio audiences, there was a lack of, there was a lack of respect for him as Prime Minister. Yes. That there, he wasn't treated with the same, uh, same respect that perhaps other Prime Ministers had. And she goes straight that. She goes straight that book. Yeah, of for, course. For Lord Ashcroft. Oh yes. And. There was no nothing to substantiate that claim, apart from one source. Down with the leads, though, eh? Um, 
We've had, of course, lots of slogans, James, uh, before this general election. Red, white and blue Brexit, a global Brexit. Now Philip Hammond has come up with a new type of Brexit. So how do we achieve this Brexit for Britain? Firstly, by securing a comprehensive agreement for trade in goods and services. Secondly, by negotiating mutually beneficial transitional arrangements to avoid unnecessary disruption and dangerous cliff edges. Again, there mention of transitional arrangements which will go down very badly uh, with some. The politics of this, we've talked about the economics, we've talked about, uh, is that Theresa May has been reduced to something of a, some, something of a spectator. Um, on the one hand, you have Philip Hammond, you have her new, um, uh, her new First Secretary of State, uh, Damien Green, uh, pro-European. You have David Liddington, who was, of course, one of the, I think, the longest ever serving Europe Minister in the mm. Foreign Office, promoted to Justice Secretary. You have Gavin Barwell, big Remainer, uh, as her Chief of Staff. And then on the other side of it, you have David Davis uh, and um, Boris Johnson. He's busy having the row of the summer. Oh, no, sorry, carry on. Um, uh, and then uh, back, ben back benches, the awkward squad would, have the, on the Tory party, would probably number somewhere between 40 and 50. This is it now. This is, this is Hammond's part to tank this morning, do you but, think? Yeah, very much so. But there's, there's very little that Theresa May can, can't, she can't shoot Philip Hammond down. She can't slap him down. So there's been no lobby briefing this morning where somebody has come out and said Philip Hammond was Does wrong. he want the job? Nobody wants the job. That's, but why not? Because what can you do? You have to trigger an election. So... Well, I, you could say, I mean, the other aspect he talked about was, you know, the country growing weary of austerity. Uh, you know, the, the Corbyn, has, Corbyn was very, you know, banging the anti-austerity drum during this election campaign. I don't think that Philip Hammond at the moment, at least, sees, sees himself taking on that job because it, it would inevitably mean another general election. So at the moment, there's a stalemate. And also, I mean, from the point of view of Johnson and Gove and, and the like, they would then have to be in charge of... Brexit, and then they will be on their watch, whereas, as Lord Lawson said at that city dinner the other night, what they really wanted was to get a massive majority, I've got the quote actually, a, 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 the massive majority, then Brexit will hurt people in the short term, poor people especially will suffer, but if they've got five years um, in the tank instead of the two they would have had, then at the end of that period they could afford to tank 50 seats and they'd still get into power for another five years. Yeah. And the other side of it, and the other side of it was that um, she, Theresa May would be able to get off the worst of the back, worst of the Brexit. You know, she would be able to come back with a deal that wasn't uh, a bad deal necessarily, but for for the Eurosceptics can get away with it. Do you think we have another referendum? No, never. I don't like to make predictions. <laughs> no, probably wise. I guess all mine have started coming true, so maybe I should make one on this. 12.47 is the time. A little bit of housework, I'll call it. I think Rob's very cross with me, and I understand why, Rob. It, it, is, it is quite an odd thing to, to, to say. He's furious that I suggested that the countries a previous caller mentioned were, in terms of economic growth, actually doing better than we are at the moment, and he's described some of the privations and horrors that he witnesses in the Greek village where he lives. Um, and uh, there is no intention to be anything other than deadly serious here, mate, when you, you describe your neighbour, Elani, as having the last working donkey in the village. Um, and uh, you must apologise, uh, admit you are wrong and stand corrected, which I, I don't enjoy doing that, but I do do it on occasion, but not on this occasion. Our first three months of this year, that's all. Just looking at GDP, looking, looking at economic growth. Um, ours was 0.2% in the first three months of this year, and Greece's was 04 We were the lowest. Um, there's 28 members of, of the bloc. Uh, first quarter GDP figures, every single one of them was, was faster than ours. That's just a fact. Year on year, we're all right, because the last six months, the post-referendum, um, slump didn't happen. It just got postponed. But of course, that's Project Fear. But the first three months, Rob, seriously, mate. I mean, it's it's it's, it's there in black and white. Uh, and I mean, it, it it it's just bad news. What's so weird about this? I was chatting with Caroline and Theo during the break, and and Axel. Uh, it's been quite a nice show today. Quite upbeat. We've actually been discussing the fact that our country is going to hail in a handcart. Oh, uh, but because we're not talking about tragedy and terrorism, it's felt like the most upbeat show in months. Or at least weeks. Tony is in Milton Keynes. Don't spoil it, Tony. What would you like to say? Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil it a little. I, I sent you a few tweets about you needing counselling under Rocky the King, and I'll play my cards on the table. I'm a GP, worked in the NHS for 30 years. Yes. I know the value 
of Europeans in our NHS. And if they go, the NHS will collapse. And that is not hyperbole, okay? Now, uh, also our biosciences and research at Oxbridge. That's just laying my cards on tape. But the reason why I've been hanging on and wanting to speak to you, and I am a fan of yours, James, despite my tweets, yes. um, is that I am a leader and I left on a tide of national fervour, okay? Right. I saw the Eurozone with its bailouts to Greece, the fact that we were the third largest contributor. I saw, if the Euro collapses, another 10 years of austerity. Okay. Having to clear up the Euro mess. I wanted our borders back, especially the fisheries. I wanted us to be in a position where we can could control our immigration, but it's dawned on me since then that the majority of immigration is actually non-EU, and Theresa May was absolutely conning us as Home Secretary. But that's aside. I am a card-carrying member of the Conservative Party. I did not want Theresa May as a Remainer. I do not like Philip Hammond as a Remainer. I just, just let me you. pause. Let me just pause you there. You're covering a lot of ground, but you, 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 yeah, sorry. you just said that the NHS will collapse, but you still absolutely. want to leave. Oh, absolutely. No, no, what I'm saying is, if the European, if we do not get reciprocity yes. with our Europeans, and they, for some reason, are used as pawns and have to leave, our NHS will collapse, period. Yes. It will. The number of nurses, doctors, uh, it will collapse. Well, well, then we probably will get reciprocity, but on the, on the question of money, or, or, I mean, just name a couple of countries that NHS workers have come from, a couple of EU countries. Spain. Portugal. Okay, I've and and, and where were they? Where were they trained? Uh, they were trained in those countries, and uh, using they, the money, uh, using the money that net contributors to the EU pay in, so that under the terms of net contributions and freedom of movement, we all benefit from the same pot. Absolutely, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with you, James. Well, what I'm are you disagreeing to... with me on, then, man? Why? Right, what I'm disagreeing <laughs> with you? No, no, I'm agreeing that David Davis is a mess. Yes. Okay? But I, I see Philip Hammond as a moderating influence. The question I'm putting to you yes. is, do you think your anxiety about the mess that we're in... Now, I don't believe that having a no deal is better than a bad deal is the wrong way to start the negotiation. Yes. Because if you're buying a house, if you don't do it like that, you're going to get walked over. No, you don't. If, you're, don't... Bu if you're buying a house, you get an estate agent or, 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 or a lawyer no, to okay, do it for but you. You know the point I'm trying to make? I do, and it's what a bogus you, point. I've heard ask, it quite a lot. Ask for more, you ask for more than realistically you're going to get. That's the point I'm trying to say. But, now, all, all I want to finish mm, with is saying, mm. look, do, are you reassured by the fact that Philip Hammond has come out? I, I don't like the guy. I don't think we should have a Remain uh, Prime Minister. I don't think we should have a Remain Chancellor. But there again, there's a lie about us having the fifth largest economy in the world. I don't believe that. Could just ask me a question but, quick before I, before I die of frustration. Yes. I've been waiting for 30 minutes, actually. Don't ask me a question! There's a hundred yes, people waiting. Are, are you reassured by Philip Hammond pouring cold water on the no deal is better than a bad deal because we would not intentionally impoverish ourselves? But he's not, he's not in charge, is he, unfortunately? He's the Chancellor. I, I, I'm reassured by Philip Hammond generally because, like everybody who really understands the fact, he thinks we should be remaining in the European Union. But uh, he can't do that. He can't say that yet, Tony, because of people like you. Yeah, but I want us to leave, and I think we will survive. But I, don't I don't want to survive, mate. I, I want to thrive. And you've mentioned immigration and fish. Man, honestly, we've got the right to stop people coming here for more than three months if they haven't got a job or a pot of cash in the bank. We've got that right. It's written down. It's law. They do it in Germany now. Did, did you still not understand that, Tony? I do understand that, James. And as you put it in your inimitable way <laughs> and your passion, I respect and admire but there is an alternative view which you may not disagree with that actually Brexit could work, okay? I don't want could. They said it definitely will. They said sunny uplands. They said we'll have our cake and eat it. They said there'll be no economic damage whatsoever. They said we'll all be better off. We'll all be rich. We'll be unhitched. It'll be a domino effect. France will be next and then Germany. They said all of that. And you still believe them. It's coming up to one o'clock. That's it from me for another day. God, it's been a while since that. It's like a test match innings.
when you do three hours on break set. So it's got, coming from all angles, all the balls. Tony at the end there with his googlies. And uh, <laughs> normally it's like a one day international. You do each subject hour by hour. Three hours on break set. Whoa, I think I've been a little bit more Ian Botham than Jeff Boycott, but it's probably not for me to say. I do a 